Uh, hello, uh, people of the internet, and uh, I guess the Death and Taxes Discord. Uh, tonight we have a very special featurette for you. It is the set review of uh, Midnight Hunt. Uh, today, me and a couple of special guests are uh, going to be going over some of the key modern playable cards um, in uh, uh, Innistrad Midnight Hunt, uh, as well as taking a closer look at some of the cards that will be specifically relevant to the Taxes uh, archetype. Um, as for my special guests, we're going to move into introductions here. Uh, first off, we have, uh, the man who could never find enough lands, uh, Death and Cat Mix. <laughs> What's up, everyone? And, uh, we're also joined by, uh, Karen's Oval, the Math Wizard. Hey there. That's, for what it's worth, I also cannot ever find enough lands, so. <laughs> Seems like we're, uh... Cat no matter what you're doing, you always need a couple more lands, hey? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Get, always rather have a couple couple more than too few. Yeah. Uh, and then a big shout out uh, to a member of the DNT Discord. Um, I think he goes by Phoenix. Uh, I can't pronounce it because it's Phoenix upside down and reversed. Uh, so it's like a secret code, like the like uh, 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 like natural treasure, like the like the like Da Vinci or something. I I don't know. But uh, they were able to uh, fix up this fancy pants slideshow we got uh, that'll make this entire viewing experience uh, seem a little bit more professional instead of just scrolling through websites. I always thought it was one of you owes us three yards. I thought it was like a football reference. Oh. One of you <laughs> owes us three <laughs> yards? <laughs> Wait, it's, it's, it, if you look at it, it's not, it's not, not unreasonable. I mean, if I squint, <laughs> I can see it maybe. <laughs> But uh, without further ado, we're going to jump right into it. Um, I should know what I, I, I've already forgotten what order these slides are. And I believe we're going to go straight into the Mythic Rares. Uh, so we're going to be going on a, a, a journey myself here. So I'm going to press next. Uh, yeah, look at that. We're going into the Mythic <laughs> Rares. <laughs> big, big brain time. Um, let's see what we got first on the uh, uh, docket. I believe it's the three new Planeswalkers that we're getting. No, it's not. I'm a big fat liar. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the multi kicker cycle. Um, one in each monocolor. Uh, if you haven't seen these cards before, basically they have a bit of a multi a, a multi kicker mechanic, but you only have to commit to paying the extra kicker costs once the creature has resolved. So it's slightly or it's slightly better against counter spells, but worse against removal. If I understand the triggers correctly, I, um, I get a feeling these things aren't going to be called the multi kicker cards. I feel like they're going to be called adversaries. I don't know, just like. I just, I just gotta... uh, what gives you that idea? Is it because they're all called adversary? Hmm. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't there a, a thing that like everything is kicker? Wasn't that a meme for a while? I think so. Yeah, everything is just, is just reskinned kicker. Yeah. You know, overload is, is just like kicker. This is kicker plus because you can like ETB it. You can you know you can ephemerate it and and start all over again. It's multi kicker. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> that's a real. That's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. So there, uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, kind of nuance with this mechanic outside of like just like it being reskinned multi kicker. Where uh, yeah, like as as Katmik said, um, uh, any kind of reuse ETB effect, ephemerate, flicker wisp, resurrection angel, you can pay. You know, you can uh, reset the thing and and pay the cost all over again. Um, same with like coming through like vial. Uh, that also counts. Um, as well as things like Collective Company is 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 pretty interesting. All these effects, of course, uh, do nothing with multi kicker. Um, <laughs> well, you got the first one here on the dock. It looks like you're interested in Intrepid Adversary. Tell uh, us about it. I mean, uh, I I put it in my list of cards that I'm interested in, mostly because I think these cards are all a trap. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think they're good. I think they're terrible. Uh, mainly because you're never going to cast this for the base cost. Like, am I going to put a 2-mana 3-1 lifelink in my deck? Like, I think I think in humans, Intrepid Hero could see some play. I, I guess. Like, does Spirits really want another 2-mana Flash Flying 2-1 that does I nothing? Mean, we, can, we, we, can, we can get to Spectral in a second, yeah. but yeah. I, I, I agree with what makes that yeah. uh, Intrepid is probably... Like, it's going to be a humans card, right? Yeah. It's... it's Human, human scout, multi kicker human. It just slots right in. It does what they want, and it's of course, you know, uh, a glorious anthem with legs. Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to point out that like my my, my main gripe with like not any, any of these cards specifically, just the, like the entire mechanic itself in this cycle. 
um, is that they're only good if you can either cheat it in with like a vial or something, or you're prepared to pay the uh, like kicker cost at least once. So this is actually a four mana card. It's a four mana card. You know, this is a five mana card, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I, like, I don't know I'm, who's I'm... gonna play this fucking three mana four three with trample. Like, no, you don't get the shit all over the rest of the cards. You, you God. said you wanted to talk about intrepid adversary. That's what I mean. Yeah, I... no, no. I'm specifically saying that. Uh, 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 Talk about the white card. one. It's bad. <laughs> yes. This is a trap. Don't play your deck. Don't well, play why'd, you, why'd you pick it as a top ten? I mean, it was it was top ten cards I want to talk about. I don't know if this is supposed to be top ten cards that I'm going to jam in my deck. Maybe that was, okay. that was a mistake. This card's a trap. Don't play it. I think it's better in humans than it is in D and T, but Maybe. I think it's reasonable in, in humans. I mean, again, it's glorious. It's another human lord. It's glorious anthem with legs. They run aether vial. Yeah. And uh, you, you know. You're gonna. You may end up losing to this card in humans, but I don't. Oh, in D and D, hundred percent hard to use. Yeah, and, humans. Uh, they're not. They're not spending four mana on this in humans. They're spending two. They're gonna vial it in. Right. This is extra copies of Thaddeus Lieutenant. And you're also missing a key factor. They run this bullshit card called Phantasmal Mage, so they can just run this one in turn turn two, but it will Thaddeus then it turn it into a four two, and then Phantasmal Mage later in the game copy it and then pay out a bunch of mana because humans hits mana. They've gotten to like five or six mana pretty regularly yeah. with normal hierarchs and whatnot. This thing's going to come down and be fucking monstrous. It didn't make my top ten, but I do think this is a good card. I don't know. All right. Try to, <laughs> uh, uh, both of you guys are, are feeling spectral adversary, so try to sell me on this uh, stupid 2 1. You want to uh, go first? You want to start <laughs> You go. I just, I just took so much air away. You go. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, it's, it's uh, cryptic command with legs, really. I mean, it basically, it's like a counter spell. I mean, in the decks that want it, obviously, it, you know, it's, it may be potentially good for spirits. It is a spirit. But even in something like, you know, blue value, whatever it would be, um, it's basically just like a, a cryptic command with legs. It, it blanks a spell, something phases out, this thing gets pumped for four mana, it counters a spell, you get a 3 2. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. And uh, it's basically spells. true value. Sorry? There's no, there's no counter spells here. Well, I mean, it, what it does is you someone points a bolt at your creature or whatever, and you phase it out. I guess. To me, it's cryptic command with legs. Cat makes. What do you think? Uh, agree on that, but I see something else different here. A big factor that's missed here is uh, the putting counters on it. So this thing's not just a tempo swing. This thing's a finisher for some people. If you pay six men all together, right? So it comes in. It's going to get two counters on it. So now it's a four three. It's a flying creature. It has flash, and you're basically tempoing somebody off of a turn. Uh, also, the fact that I think the mind just naturally wants to jump to like tempo in against creatures. This thing phases artifacts and enchantment. So, like in this format, that's a lot of different things, right? Like for modern, it's the druid inside of um, uh, amulet. It's hitting Urza sagas. Like there's just all types of random things that this thing can do that are interesting. And to your point, like it protects things on your side of the board. So cryptic, I mean, yes, you can cryptic bounce your own things, but that rarely happens. This card just, like, that phase-out mechanic gets to point so many different directions while putting a pretty reasonable threat on the board while you do it. So I think this card's good somewhere. I don't know what deck wants it. I don't know which formats want it. But this card, is, in my opinion, is the best out of the cycle. I, I mean, I agree it. with that. <laughs> I don't buy it. I don't know. Four mana for this thing, six mana for this thing for like two targets. Ugh. Eh. Eh. We'll see. I basically think you're basically you're. If you need a in spirits or something, if you need a two one flyer, it's there. And for four mana, it it basically feels like cryptic command to me. All right. So we we'll skip tainted adversary. We'll skip bloodthirsty yeah, the, adversary. No. And uh, Karen, why do you want to talk about primal adversary? I just, I don't think there's a whole lot to note here, but I think it's pretty efficient on rate. So, like, it's not even terrible at three mana. It comes down as a four, three trample with, with no value for three. But, like, if you put one set of counters on it, you've now put eight points of power on the board across two bodies, which is actually pretty, pretty reasonable, pretty efficient. So, I just think that the thing to note here is, like, if you bump into a mid range deck, be it Ponza or whatever it's not actually a bad top end threat because it not only does it go tall it goes wide so um i just think it's efficient on rate and that that alone makes it notable all i see is an underpowered wall of resurgence here (laughs) (laughs) 
worst wall of resurgence. Yeah, the, the mythic wall of resurgence out here selling pack. Yeah. Cool. All right. We feel good about our conversation around adversaries. Should we move on? Uh, one last thing I want to note is that uh, outside of the green one, uh, there is some interesting interactions with Luris with these with these other four. Now, if you're playing Luris, you can still play these, and you can still like kick them out of the graveyard for like a boatload in like the yeah. late game, which is a uh, kind of kind of slick. Yeah, so especially they, they adding straws until eventually one breaks the camel's back on the Lurus fan. I that guess. What you're telling me? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean that's that's more talking about how busted Lurus is more than what these cards can do. That's that's like a Lurus I don't, I don't, even, I don't even call it Lurus anymore. I call it a uh, a uh, Lurus caster mage. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, except that you, you you can keep flashbacking your creatures over and over again. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Yeah, let's move on here. Uh we got some planeswalkers. Uh I think they're all terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really think we need to spend time here. It's great to put them up on screen. Yeah, someone can pause it on your YouTube channel, revisit these read. cards. But yeah. yeah, but let's 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 move yeah. on. I'll 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 give a shout out to the meme that is Ren and Seven. I mean, we've been memeing about you know like oh imagine Ren and Seven right, but they actually did it. So I mean, props to Watsi for doing that meme. Yeah, but uh, we'll just move on here. Uh, all right, we got some of the mythics. Uh, no one cares about the white one. But uh, Karen's cat makes you guys have uh, some some topics on this poppet stitcher, uh, the souped up um, young pyromancer. Uh, I'll, I'll start on this one. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah I was gonna say you're up. Yeah, so poppet stitcher, like I think when you see that the creature has decayed, it makes you go, oh, maybe not so much. Right. Um, but once you flip this thing and it turns them into three threes that no longer have text boxes. Um, this card's really scary, because all you have to do is just kind of like sit around and start dirtling spells around, and you're not really using the zombies yet. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to get to a spot. You flip this poppet stitcher, and now all of a sudden you've got a card that's really hard to interact with because it's no longer a creature. Like yes, you can pop artifacts, but like you're not really winning when you do that. Like your opponent's flipping three threes back into two twos that were already attacking after your opponent dumped a bunch of spells on you. Mm -hmm. To me, this feels like. Thing in the ice, but like in a busted form. This card's really scary to me. So anyway, Kaz, what do you think? I totally agree with you. And the other thing I'll note is that it doesn't just turn the decayed tokens into you know three threes with no text box. It's any creature token. So like you could do this with lingering souls. You could do this with young pyromancer. I mean, it's not just another young pyromancer. It's like a card you're going to run alongside young pyromancer that does the exact same thing. And then once it flips, it's even worse. Yeah. And it's also not legendary. So, like, you can have double of these on the board. Um, right. One flipped, one yeah. unflipped. Yeah. So, cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, I, uh, uh, I do also like how, I mean, if, if, if something happens and, like, your board gets, like, wiped by, like, Supreme Verdict, you just, you just turn it back into a 2 3. <laughs> yeah. You can be like, yeah, all right, let's that, just start again, I guess. <laughs> the fact that you can choose when to flip this thing back is insane. Like, yeah. That's nuts. All right, so then, uh, Karen, do you want to talk about Jaren? Yeah, and the yeah, Ormond doll. I just had a, yeah, I just had a note here that, like, uh, as we've learned from many designs throughout the years, the bigger the text box, the more dangerous the card. <laughs> um, this is a card that just does a lot of things. Even if you, like, don't care about the flipping ability, like, you could basically slot this into humans and it would be reasonable. Um, you know, it basically comes down as three power, four toughness across two bodies. It's sort of kind of uh, 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 the Bitter Blossom-ish. Um, and then, of course, if you're actually in humans, uh, you know, it basically is Bitter Blossom and you're giving everything life blank. So, like, I don't think... I, the only thing I want to note about this card is that the text box is big. It does an awful lot of stuff. It isn't a bad option in humans, and we'll see if it sticks the format. Yeah, I was pretty high on this card. It didn't make my top ten of cards I wanted to talk about, but I will note that yes, it can work in humans. But like, I think there's aristocrat style decks and maybe even um, the Yogmoth style decks that could like abuse this ability to sack out creatures and just get triggers happening all over the place. I don't think we're going to see the Armenthal very often, but I think the front half of the card's already problematic. There's just too much text on the on the text box. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it does remind me a bit of a like almost Battlescale effect for humans. Sometimes they like can't close up the game because they're getting jump blocked. So, you know they're like 
giant champion that's like a 10 10 is just getting like chomped or whatever and then your opponent just kind of like flies over or like burns you out um so having two mana then turning your 10 10 into a 10 10 light blinker uh is going to be useful in some games i think i'm also curious to see if anybody does some weird stuff where they can like pain life themselves the 13 really easily and get this thing to flip very often right um the weird part is that like i don't know if the back side is better than the front side like sure it's a big dumb beater that has like almost grizzle brand text anytime something says sacrifice to draw cards and there's no mana involved i'm always scared of that yeah like yeah like that part's very very strong i don't care about the body but the body's whatever the flying travel that, light like six six that's whatever i mean i have to i have to beat seven seven merc tides right now so <laughs> <laughs> a, a six six doing all this stuff is the same thing but i am scared to see a mechanic where it's just like yeah just draw your deck if you know like to us, 13 is the hurdle, but, like, if you want your deck to get you to 13, I feel like there's got to be cards out there where you can just randomly start choosing to pay one life, and it's not hard to do. Like, something's like pay a life, do something stupid, pay something, do something stupid, and then, like, you're purposely getting yourself to 13, and your opponent can't really interact with it really well. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. And if you have the front half and the back half off, then all of a sudden you're drawing two cards per sack thing, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I can't mix. Looks like you have some interest, or you have an interesting take on uh, the meme name of Hostile Hostile. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty cold uh, cold on this one, so uh, maybe you can change my mind here. Um, I, I I don't like the card as far as like being someone who plays fair decks like D and T. Yeah, but I'm lo I'm looking at how easy it is to flip. Um, again, some decks don't care about sacking creatures, right? Mm -hmm. Some decks like it's either tokens or it's creatures where there's up value for s sacrificing them. And I'm not even sure that modern decks want to do this. I'm like, who knows? But it's not hard to get this thing to flip. And when it's on a land, that's just a dangerous place to be. The backside of this card um, does a reasonable amount. It exiles stuff from the graveyard. It's getting extra damage through. Mm -hmm. The only reason that I'm weak on it is the backside becoming an artifact. If this thing would have just flipped into anything else or been indestructible or something, I think everybody would play it. So I think the fragility is actually important in the design space. But I do think someone's going to put this in a deck somewhere, and it's going to be really, really hard to interact with and deal with. Yeah, I mean, I'd be higher on, on this card if the front side wasn't activate only as sorcery. Yeah, that hurts it a lot. But again, I think that's just going to put it in decks that want to be sacrificing creatures for yeah. upside value. Um Again, I don't, I, I just, I don't want to take on the job of figuring out what those decks are. But this thing's got a mythic rare for a reason. It's not going to be powerful. Like this, if you look at the design space on this card, this was not built for limited. This effect, in their quote unquote testing, did something to put this in the mythic rare slot. Right. Um, I, I do think that there is some implications here that I just don't see yet, and somebody, somebody else has already seen them and will do something cool with it. But that's my take. I mean, just it's a it's a mythic rare title. It's a mythic rare meme, right? The hostile, hostile. Yeah. <laughs> and creeping in, oh. Yeah. Man, they I... put money into the, <laughs> they, they put money into the art too. That's always a, a big factor of a, a card's playability. Did yeah. they spend money on the artwork? <laughs> yeah, the art is su is super fun. I like the art for sure. Yeah. All right, let's let's head out of this yeah, uh, terrible let's move on. Space. Uh, <laughs> Other mythic creatures, Asterix and Meat Hook. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't think any of us care about any of these cards. Um, no, I think we should just move on. They are all. I mean, they're they're, they're fine. There's yeah. a new, uh, you know, shout out to my uh, buddy um, Rob who plays Ooze Tribal. There's an Ooze here for you, so that one's for you. Congrats, Rob. You got your blob. Yeah. All right, we're going to the rare slot now. This is where you do the good cards are. Uh, hilariously Oof. enough. Um, and uh, I mean, go. everyone wants to talk about Brutal Cathar. Uh, when do you guys can start? What do you got? I mean, am I am I all right? I, I guess yeah. I'll start. Um, this is basically just a, a giant fiend hunter upgrade for for our deck. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues with fiend hunter used to be that it had one power, like you'd eat something and then it wouldn't have a clock. Mm -hmm. And this definitely has a clock. Um, and of course, if you're lucky and it survives, you can start tucking more than one creature when you go from day to night. And you know, I know that it, it only exiles another one whenever it turns to day, but um, this is a pretty big upgrade for Fiend Hunter. It's much more aggressive. The ward on the backside for paying three life is pretty effective. Um, it's going to eat something, and it's going to swing, and that's a big upgrade for the deck. It's nice to have it. I don't know if it's 
depending, it may be main deckable, but it's certainly sideboardable, and uh, I'm glad we have it. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, in, in Magic Christmas Land, I would love to have this just start, like, you know, flip back and forth, eat creatures all day. Uh, but, like, even then, even for just, like, the, like, base value of, like, on your turn, you, like, untap, your vials on three, you vial it in, you take a creature, you cast no other spells, and then it flips to the 3-3 three, three, uh, with the, like, ward pay, pay, pay like, through life, and then first strike, which is not an uh, uh, irrelevant keyword. Um, so, I mean, at its worst, I mean, at its worst, it is a fiend hunter, right? You take the thing, they, they bolt or whatever, and then that's it. Um, medium, medium games, uh, it's gonna, you're, you're, you're gonna steal something, it'll flip into the wolf side, and then to get that thing back, they're gonna have to bolt themselves, which again, not terrible. And then of course, yeah, magic, uh, uh, in, in Magic Christmas Land, you know, you flip it, you flip it back, you get a second thing, you flip it back over, you flip it back, you get a third thing, um, and of course that's, that's scary in itself, I mean, one removable spell and all of a sudden their board is back. But uh, the card is interesting. I don't know if it's necessarily better than what we have. Uh, like, sure, it can hit any creature, which is nice. I mean, we're seeing a lot of creatures in Modern now that are just out of Skyclave range, which I don't think is a coincidence. I think Wizards baited us all into buying Skyclaves and then printed creatures that, that you can play for cheaper. Uh, you, you, don't mean, you don't mean that. <laughs> I mean it. We got, we got super baited. This is my tinfoil hat theory. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know. Does this, re does know. this replace Skyclave? Eh. Maybe. Yeah, I know Catmix probably has stuff to add, but uh, you know, I, the one thing I'll insert in here is uh, you can't play defense with it, Catmix, can you? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me let me get a crack at this. Yeah. Step one to both of you heathens. So let's, let's slow down for a second. All right. <laughs> I said it was good. Don't give me that. No, 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 no. no but 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 we 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 we've, we've not given this card nearly enough credit for what it's capable of doing. I'm not, here's the part that's really frustrating, is we do this thing a lot where we go, oh, this card versus this other card. I don't even look at this card this way. I would never put Fiend Hunter in the place of my Sky Glaze, but I would sideboard Fiend Hunters. Why don't I sideboard Fiend Hunters? Because as Karen said, they don't have a clock. But having three to four copies of this as my removal spell out of my board, now sends my deck into a territory where I've got Solitude, this, and Sky Glaze against my opponents. Um, we're also missing other parts of like, the gang game plan right here, like you're playing either Wisp or you're playing Charming Prince. You have Gimmer Runes to protect this thing. Your opponent is going to get into situations where they are forced to try and either go around this thing or through this thing, and it flipping back and forth does accrue value over time. Not to mention, let me ask you a question. Your opponent fights through and finally gets your first Brutal Cathar off the board, and you have a second one in your hand. You've time-walked them. They spent all this time trying to get their threat back for you to just take it back. And you get to just start the chain up all over again. And all while this is happening, you're drawing your other cards, you're setting up Ephemerates, you're setting up Charming Princes, all this crazy stuff, right? Like, this card is deceiving because you're looking at it as it's the only answer you have to all these different things. No, this lets you pick more spots. Now I've got my hand where there's Solitude, Skyclave, and uh, Brutal Cathar. I can choose. Hmm, do I want the Brutal Cathar to take the one drop off the board? Do I want it to take the bigger threats? Do I want it to eat a token that they're just not going to be able to accrue value back from again? And all of a sudden, my thing flips into a 3-3 that there's no reason for them to kill. But if they cast two spells in one turn, I get to flip it back and actually take an actual creature. Like, this card's text box is, is really hard to see and understand at first. But I think with more games, we'll see that as valuable. I think even in Legacy, they'll probably play one because they can recruit her for it. They can. And it doesn't have to come... What's that? Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I do think this card's really good. I just don't think it needs to be something where it's competing for other card slots or spaces. Um, the question for me will always be, is this in a metagame that's worth taking up space on my sideboard or not? Right now, I wish this thing existed right now because it would be in my board. Because I want more removal, but I don't... Path is not where I want to be at in removal. Mm -hmm. I'm able to take my time because of Solitude. I just need more things off the top end that just answer like a Merc Tide. Even if they reset the Tide, like, Get a 3-3 back. I don't give a shit. But, like, I need to stop the turn that you made a 7-7 Murktide and not let you draw lands or whatever it is from it and then force you to have the answers on top of that. So I'm a huge fan of this card. I'm excited for this card. It's actually one of the cards I'm most 
excited about. And that's probably because of my relationship with Feed Hunter. <laughs> Still no defense. <laughs> um. Yes. It, it's it's this card can't block until it flips. But I think this card's more dangerous, and that's the part that I'm excited about. Why, well, Matt? You can't tuck your own stuff. Oh, I don't. You don't need to do that. Anymore. That only mattered in the world where people were playing Terminus and Supreme Bird. Those days are over. <laughs> Sorry, control players. Yeah. Uh, our condolences. Yeah, I, not at all. You can take your Terminus and shove it. All right, anyway, <laughs> you, two, you two have stuff to say about Graveyard Trespasser. Let's hear that. Yeah. yeah I'll have to you about it. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I also want to hide, uh, uh, hide this one mostly because uh, there's some shade that I'm going to throw at a white card that does a similar thing later down the road when we get there. But uh, I think this is a, a sick Graveyard Hate card that's just like incidental hate. I mean, a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with Ward discard a card, it has basically the, like, Reality Smasher text on it, <laughs> is, 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 is sick. Uh, and then just having the free, that, uh, that, uh, uh, the, the free Griver Hate just, like, like, stapled on. Um, and then, and then on top of that, when you do hate their graveyard, they lose life and you gain life. This card does it all. And then when it flips, it does it twice. <laughs> like... All these cards that are like enter the battlefield or attacks, they're they're just ugh, I hate this mechanic, but like it's it's where we're going now. Where all creatures now, all the good ones, not only do they, do they have to get value when they enter, they also gotta get value when they attack. Uh, and of course, <laughs> when it like flips, it's a four four. Still has the ward discard a card on it. Uh, so your your opponent, unless they trade in combat, they can't really trade evenly with this thing. Right, because because they have to reality smash them 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 them, them like sell there. They gotta like, you know, fetch fatal push, discard a card. Like ooh, which I mean, then I guess you could say powers up your your second one. Um, I wish, I, you know, I wish this this card was white. Maybe you know, maybe I'll I'll splash black for it. Eh, but uh, card is fun. Uh, Karen's, what do you think? I mean, I think that that's mostly right. I mean, like, it's it's not quite Reality Smasher because it doesn't have Trample, but yeah. certainly, like, Ward, this Dart card is a... It's hard for your opponent to remove this without it being a two-for-one. And it swings for more than the, the power on its face because when it uh, enters the battlefield or it attacks, you get that effect. So basically, like, on the front side, it actually swings for up to four. Like, it's either three or four. Mm -hmm. On the back side, it swings for up to six. So... It's pretty powerful on rate. It's pretty effective. It's hard to remove. I don't know that it's breaking the game in half, certainly not relative to some of the stuff that we have going on, but I do think that like on rate, you're getting a lot of value out of this card. Yeah. My only concern is its casting cost. Three is a lot of mana for this effect. That's fair. Yeah, it, but, it, yeah. it can be slow for like when you want to hit out specific graveyard decks. Well, and black. I think that's a lot yeah. of mana for a black card as far as the, the graveyard part. I think the the creature part of it is fine. The ETB attacking part is like, eh, black black's trying to hit on graveyards way more effectively than that. But anyway. Yeah. I don't disagree with you guys. Alright, moving on. Uh we got some werewolves here, some stuff that flips. Uh Karen's you're interested in the uh what is it, like werewolf lord? <laughs> yeah, Tobler? I just want I just wanted to note it because like every time we get like a new lord in like in any tribe, in any set, it's always worth pointing out because eventually there's going to be a lord that actually makes the tribe playable. I don't know if this is it, but this is certainly one of the most powerful like werewolf lords we've seen. And uh, you know, whenever a wolf or werewolf you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. That's a really strong effect. I mean, if you're playing werewolf tribal and you got this on the battlefield, you your opponent can't let you connect. So. Uh, just worth noting, I don't think I would spend a lot of time on it, but um, that's a pretty impressive piece of text on a lord. Yeah, it's definitely designed to push werewolves and, like, commander and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, Spirits was really a deck until they printed Supreme Phantom, right? Um, It was a deck. I mean, it wasn't tiered. It was, like, there was no reason to play it when you had Merfolk, so now yeah. it's the... Now it's the complete opposite because of Phantom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like echoing what like um, um, Charence is saying. How like yeah, like all takes you know is one new lord, and all of a sudden your like tribal deck is playable now. Um, so I, yeah. I I don't know if this makes Werewolf playable now, but uh, you know I won't I won't be mad if I get beat up by Werewolf tribal. I mean I'm just I you know again I don't think it's like broken or anything. I just think it's worth noting because this is a this is a 
a lore for werewolves that has a really relevant piece of text. Yeah. It's in the wrong colors is my issue. Like right. red green is going to have a real hard time defending itself. And that text box is great, but like the best tribes that aren't humans, well, even humans all run blue inside of them. That's fair. So yeah. blue, blue has to be shoehorned in here somehow for this to, to kind of piece together. Because it really, red green cannot defend itself at all. And it's not fast enough. But anyway. I, I digress. Your point stands. Uh, we can move on. Yep. Uh, thumbs up for Werewolf Tribal. Uh, moving on, we got uh, non-daybound, non-nightbound uh, DFCs. I don't think we care about any of these. No, let's move on. <laughs> Please don't play this Denic Pious Apprentice card. Card's bad. Uh, we got Monocolor Legendaries, which we also don't care about. Um, this white one. Uh, uh, just play, just play Birdman's, right? <laughs> Uh, Commander, you play this, and constructed format, you play neither. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, minor shout out to uh, Gisa as maybe a replacement for. Uh... Wow, what's the name of that uh, three four vampire that exile stuff and makes and makes zombies? O- only you would. Kalidus. Kalidus, yeah. If you want, you know, if you want to play play this instead of Kalidus, you go for it. <laughs> Got some fun text where uh, you kill a creature and, you, and then you get to steal it. It's pretty cool. Only, you, only you've actively played that and constructed. The rest of <laughs> the rest of us have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know. All right. Yeah, uh, I played it against it and constructed, so I know what he's talking about. There we go. I've seen it in Pioneer a lot, you know. <laughs> All right, Karen, do you want to talk about Rim Cal- Carolus? Carol uh, Carola. I Rim actually Carola. highlighted this as like a potential DNT card. I mean, actually, Ooh. we've talked about uh, wanting Mark of Asylum there. And this is close to Mark of Asylum. Bear. If a spell would deal damage to you or another permanent you control, prevent it. Uh, and of course, if a spell would deal damage to an opponent or permanent uh, an opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus one instead. It's it's got flying, it's got haste for three mana. I mean, it's pretty good on rate, and it's close to Mark of Asylum. Bear. So that's that's kind of what I wanted to note about it. There's okay. one card that I need to exist for me to play a card like this, and Wizard scrubbed it from the file. It's called um, Caracus. Karokus, Kar- Kar- <laughs> yeah. Kar- Thanks, you know. Sam Black. Look, yeah. hope, hope springs eternal, and uh, <laughs> you know, time, time is a flat circle, and eventually it'll get added back to the file. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Um, so what then, is this uh, slime like, thing, though? <laughs> yeah, it looks like Karen's and I both want to talk about Slogurk. Um, yeah, I'll, it's I'll, I'll let you oh, yeah, get started. Yeah, it's basically Life from the Loam. It's, it's the next mistake after... <laughs> um, What's the last one that they made? Not Oka. We have an after. Uro. Uh, Euro. 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 Uh, yeah. The classic it, it, one green, blue, three mana, uh, legendary, mistake. three, three. Yeah. yeah. They felt they got slick because this one doesn't have a three letter name. It's Slogurk. So it's a lot harder to pronounce. Mm-hmm. And that means it's not bannable. Right. But um, the concern with this card is, like, I don't think enough people are stopping to think about what happens when you implement fetch lands in with this card. So this thing comes down early. Who cares if you return it to your hand or not? That's what I mean. But the ability to just like start racking up counters on it, it's already got trample built into it. And then when you finally either kill this thing or they return it back to their hand, they just get the life from the land. And you gotta remember the types of land your opponents are putting into their graveyards. Urza's sagas, fetch lands, like this is a bad place for a card design, but it's a really good card. Uh Karen, what do you think? <laughs> I mean I just I just totally agree with you. I mean to me it's supposed to be like an attempt at sort of a fixed curro and I hate everything about it. Um, it is life from alone. It's like part Ren and Six. It's just kind of nasty all around. You have to believe that the decks that this is going to go into are going to play a ton of fetch lands, potentially Urza Saga. And it basically has a kind of shroud where, like, if you go after it, it's a 3 3 trample on rate, so it's already good. But, like, whenever you put a land card into your graveyard from anywhere, you put a 1 1 counter on this thing. If it has three 1 1 counters on it, you literally, you know, you just bounce it back to your hand. And, uh, you know, whenever this thing leaves the battlefield, you return all the lands back. So it's got an infinite supply of 1-1 one, one counters. And, of course, you just get to play one per turn or two if you got to fetch land. Uh, I guess I you get one because it's, it's, it's going to the graveyard. But I, I still think this card is really good. It has protection. It has trample. It's powerful. And it feels like a fixed arrow. And what I really don't like about it is that my opponents get to recycle their lands forever. Yeah, I can't wait till somebody shows me a really shitty mana base that supports this card with Seismic Assault. <laughs> and then people are just like, because it says when a land goes into the graveyard from anywhere, it doesn't really care. Um, I mean, we we already know how annoying it was to play against Uro, where like they just get to draw a card and then put a land on 
So like you get you're telling me that the, you could basically rebuild some of the some of the blue green mid range decks uh, using this card and like I don't know it doesn't seem terrible. If you just put even one or two counters on this thing, it's already just dangerous without the rest of the text box. For sure. So yeah, that's my take. Uh, yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. I didn't really think about it that way. I kind of just skimmed past the slime card. But, uh, yeah, I, I I guess if you're playing a, like, control deck and, and, and you can get to, like, three lands, uh, you're not going to be stuck on lands the rest of the game. Yeah. Because, like, stupid. they're going to have, you know, you're, 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 like, like, your, like, opponent can't ignore this. They have to deal with it at, at, at some point. And when they do, you get all your lands back, and then you have no land problems the rest of the game. What was your friend's name? Rob? Rob, yeah. Yeah, Rob, you, you got another one. That's gotta, what, that's what you you got to play this one. <laughs> All right, well, Uro 2.0, right. you yeah. decide. All right, moving on. Um, yeah. We got uh, some creatures in the set. Uh, Cat Mix is uh, building Zombie Tribal. I'm not, but I, I think to like Karen's point earlier about tribal cards, um, Zombies got really close to modern playable there for a little bit. And it started to fall a little bit behind, and I think a big part of that was um, not having decent one drops. I don't know if you guys realize this, but this is the first time in a long time where we've had a one drop zombie that can block, but also yeah. loves to eat up its own zombie friends, uh, just like uh, uh, you know, like most zombie decks do. But like you can play uh, what's the other one drop? The two one? I don't know why I can't think of its name. Grave crawler. Right. Grave crawler. Mm -hmm. Like all your grave crawler shenanigans. This card loves them. Um, this thing's going to get pretty big fast in a zombie deck. I think this is actually a really good one-drop zombie. So, um, congrats, zombie players. That's all I got to say about this one. Yeah, I do I mean, like the callback, Champion of the Parish. Yeah. Yeah, definitely de de definitely fun flavor win there. You know, Champion of the Parish, yeah. Champion of the Parished. It's pretty yeah. uh, clever there. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I've seen Aspiring Spike play some zombie brews. And, yeah, they usually evolve around... Some sort of grave crawler plus uh, carrying feeder Goblin. shenanigans, yeah, or goblin bombardment. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I I can definitely see that. Yeah, be so now you got uh, the combo with this and grave crawler and carrying feeder. Where now every time that you sack the grave crawler to carrying feeder, it gets bigger, and then this also gets bigger for free. Yeah, um, which is yeah, pretty I mean. It's, it's a pretty good card. So tell us about Sun Gold Sentinel. Sun Gold Sentinel. So throwing some shade here, because this is uh, a bit of, this is like the worst version of, the, of, of, of that like black card, unfortunately. Um, the stats though are nice. Uh, it seems like Wizards are starting to give white cards better stats, it seems, these days. Because normally two mana cards, we don't see 3-2 on a two mana white card. We, we, you know, we're always complaining about like, like two mana, 3-2 green cards. Um... But, I mean, the effect where it enters, you know, you get some small graveyard hate, and then you get the also attacks, does the same thing. Um, but you don't get the, like, uh, life drain that the black one does. Um, and the coven bit is, like, weird protection? It's like, it, it's, it's like they wanted to put protect, they, they, they wanted to print, like, to the color, it gets protection for that color, but they didn't want to do that. So they just, like, did everything except that. It just gets hexproof and... Can't be blocked, so you can still, I guess, give her runes if you want. Um, I think the problem with, and, and I, I thought about this a lot, is protection is not a keyword. There's no way they would have fit an explanation uh, of protection into a right with the coven <laughs> text as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot going on. So that's probably why I got heads proof. That's actually hilarious. I can I can buy that. So, um, but if you're if you're if you're playing Graveyard Hate in D and T, uh, just know that that because because I know I I am certain that over the next few months we're gonna be people asking us, hey, should I play Sun Gold Sentinel? And I'm gonna tell you, bruh, we got Rest in Peace, we got Sanctifier. What more do you want? Like, I'd play Remorseful Cleric before I'd play this. Yeah, yeah. I, to me, the like, if you look at it without the Coven on the card, it's like not great yeah like again it's a little aggressive and it does partially what you want but it's not doing what you want it to do and then when you add the coven it's hard to depend on coven i think mm -hmm. um and so you know obviously it's better with coven and that takes up most of the text box but you can't depend on it and i don't want to play it without the coven yeah yeah well shout out for two mana three two uh moving on yeah uh, we got nothing here. Uh, shout out to Triska Decophile. Uh, if you have 13 cards, you win the game. 
That's pretty fun. <laughs> you notice its power and toughness is 13, right? I did. I'm yeah, sure that in the one. art, there's a bunch of 13 <laughs> references. Can I know that the original Innistrad had, what, like, uh, Triskaidekaphobia? Which is the enchantment where if a player has 13 life, they, like, lose the game. And that had a bunch of, like, 13 references in it. And I'm sure if you kept the fingers, that's about 13, some other fun shit like that. So, uh, yeah. look at that art. Find some Easter eggs. It's probably fun. Um, Artifacts Enchantments. Uh, we all know about Pith and Needle, which is great. Um, Curse of Silence. Do we want to talk about this briefly? Uh, no, no, none of us no. highlighted it, but I mean, we already have people asking there's, about Curse of Silence. There's, there's nothing to talk about here. This card, right. that's this, right. it's not, it's not a card. Like, I want to save us some time for some other stuff. If yeah. somebody wants to play Curse of Silence, enjoy it. But it literally is just the longest text box of do nothing. Yeah, like <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm. I'm I'm higher on the card than Cat Mix, but I'm, it's not high enough fun for me to be to be notable. I mean, in certain metagames, maybe that's the right answer to whatever the problem is, but, you know, I don't think it's great. Yeah, I think if you're going to suspect, like, just play Blue, play Meddling Mage, you know, make sure they can't cast a spell at all, <laughs> instead of the, like, okay, I'll pay two more, and then you can draw a card. <laughs> Who cares? Uh, instant Sorceries, me and Cat Mix are high on uh, Faithful Absence. Uh, yeah, go ahead, take the way. Sure, bit of uh, you know I've heard many people tell me that that this card is terrible, uh, but bruh, what are you smoking? I think this card is great. This is just a better uh, deck and stone, and I mean, and and yes, we're not playing deck and stone now, but we but we have played deck and stone, uh, and like the 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 main issue with 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 deck and stone, in my opinion, is that it's a sorcery. A lot of the white. Removal spells are bad because they're sorcery, but 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 this is an instant, which 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 I think ups the value like immensely, just makes it huge. Um, and they get a clue, you know, they get a card, whatever, but, but they gotta pay two mana for it. I'd rather give them uh, a a clue that they have to crack than like a basic land for me. Um, Camus, what do you think? I think all that stuff sounds really good, but the reason I'm here for this card is. The only reason I would ever splash black is to get to Vindicate mm -hmm. so that I can hit Planeswalkers. I now don't have to do that work in Mono White. Like, yeah. being able to hit a Karn or a Jace or whatever at instant speed is absolutely worth letting my opponent draw a card. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I like this card. I, I think that Creature or Planeswalker is a huge, huge factor in liking this card. So that's where I signed up for it at. Yeah, same. Just the, like, uh, unconditional the unconditional part of it is 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 like just just like great it's like oh you play murktide you know now nah, you can have a clue instead yeah i think Absolutely. the card is is good and i certainly agree with you know the the points that cat mix made i'll just note that we now have access to a lot of really good removal now that we have you know solitude basically we have like solitude and path and of course to cat mix's point you really want to play faithful ab absence to get access to like planeswalker removal specifically so mm -hmm. For me, it's not really a go-to piece of removal anymore, but like in certain metagames, certain matchups, I can totally see why this is good. Yeah. yeah, I want to have it ready in the board. I want to be able to access this if I want. This reminds me a little bit of like Council's Judgment for Modern, where it's like I can basically get anything off the board at this point now with my sideboard slot if I need it. Yeah, and and like, sure, you can never trade great with Renin 6, but at least this deals with Renin 6, you know, on turn two. Um, yeah. And I am, I'll take I'm, you know... I'll take any removal spell that can take anything off the board with, like, minimal flinching. So yeah. I don't think I have four of these on my board or something, but there's a world where, like, hey, I need to mix up my removal package out of my board, and this might be something that could squeeze its way in. Exactly. The more we get cards like this allows us to not be on, like, four copies of, like, the same exact effect over and over again. Like, we can actually have a mixed bag again. So, like, as long as stuff like this keeps coming, this is, like, actually a win for D&T sideboards. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've 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 always been a fan of the sideboards that have a lot of singleton cards in it, but the cards overlap in function, right? Like you'll have three different cards that all overlap on one part, then you'll have some of those cards overlap with other cards in your sideboard that do a similar function. So just having options, yeah. I think, is the important part about fate, or about like fate, fateful absence. Yeah. Um, what about memory deluge? I I super over this card. I don't even know what's going on here. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you're going to look at the top X cards of your library. X is the amount of mana spent to cast a spell. Um, this card's actually really good because it's like a factor of fiction that you don't have to like have an opponent for. Mm -hmm. um, you spend four mana. You're going to look at the top four instead of five. But your opponent doesn't really get to determine like what they have to play through. There's no browbeat effect on it. Right. Um, and then like 
some decks are actually just going to flash his back. And digging seven cards deep is basically a tutor, especially off of an instant. Yeah. So, like, I think reclamation, wilderness reclamation decks run Factor Fiction. I could see the, I could see Factor Fiction basically going into exile now that they have memory deluge. Like, I think this is just probably a higher functioning version of Factor Fiction. That's fair. Yeah, uh, yeah, they could they could easily on turn four, like on your end step, like uh, uh, cast this and then untap, play a land. Uh, Play their like un- or the the uh, uh, like uh, uh, wilderness. Yeah, and then like next turn, flash it back right with the like yeah. tap on tap part. Um, and I mean, we all know how good digging seven deep is. We've all played against Daisy time. Um, a, a little tongue and cheek thing too is if we have Thalia out, we force them to pay five, and they basically get a factor fiction, and we don't get a choice. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, Thalia makes us worse, which is hilarious. Well, I'll uh, keep an eye on memory uh, uh, deluge then, because yeah. honestly, if this is better than fact, better if, if 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 this is better than than fact or fiction, um, I'm fine with it because I'm certain I've never made a good fact fiction pile in my entire life. <laughs> now, I, now, it's, now it's off your shoulders. Now you right? can lose with you can lose with honor now. <sighs> Finally, because like man, every time I'm like, dude, 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 like I just fuck up. Like I don't want to give my opponent the win by giving them like like the perfect fact fiction piles. Just let them do it. I, you know, I don't want to do it. Before we leave this page, can I make one actual hilarious yeah. joke? Uh, so when the spoiler came through for Vanquish the Horde, mm-hmm. I was reading this, and I think I was so locked into the art, looking just like some, you know, it's Odric going nuts. I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, like dude. some real powerful creature thing happening here. And I, was, I read Destroy All Creatures, and I was like, why would I want to do that as a DMT player? And then I realized, like, oh, this is for white decks that don't play creatures, which mm-hmm. I guess is a thing. But I, I was just so <laughs> locked into DMT where I'm just like, why in the world would I ever blow up all my own creatures? Who wants this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the Wizards design space where it's like, ah, oh, yes, white cards uh, are ones that make a bunch of small 1-1 one, one tokens that flood the board and board wipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Exactly. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure that Vanquish the Horde is just like the best uh, Wrath of God in Commander. Is that fair? Yeah, this supersedes uh, the Blasphemous Act, right? Like, yeah, because Blasphemous Act doesn't actually kill. So, like, if you have or if you have like things that, uh, actually, I don't know if this is better than Blasphemous. I mean, it does. It deals thirteen damage, I think. Yeah. Which I, I mean, know. a lot of the time is destroy all creatures. That's hard to tell. I, I'm not a seasoned enough commander player to know. Yeah. Because so. like neither hit through like indestructible. So I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's, you know, maybe, maybe this is just for the for the decks that are 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 running white but not red. As... Yeah. It's fine. Right. Congrats, Commander players. You got more options. Moving on, uh, we got some instructions part two. I don't think anybody cares about any of these cards. Nope. Let's move on. Uh, that's cute cats in it. Sweet. Moving on. Uh, well, Catmix likes a Dire Strain Rampage. Let me tell you, before we started doing this this stream, I was clicking through these slides, and I saw you pick pick this one up, and I, I read it, and I'm not getting it. <laughs> so All right, I mean, so destroy, yeah, destroy target enchantment or land. Or artifact. I'm sorry, artifact, artifact enchantment or land. Mm-hmm. If that was destroyed this way, as controller searches the library for up to two basic land cards. Pretty cool. Put them on the battlefield tapped. Otherwise, as controller may search the library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield then tapped. Um, I don't think we stopped enough to realize like this doesn't say something your opponent controls. It's just mm-hmm. a any of these permanents. So you can blow up your own shit and go get lands and shit off of it. So I think for like red green pawns, this is like a pretty sick fucking card. Yeah, I mean, in in my mind, the like cute thing is like you uh, blow up your own flagstones. Yeah, you know that's pretty yeah. fun. You go and fetch up three lands for your one land, and all of a sudden you're at uh, you're uh, untapping with with five lands, and you're ready to flash back it again if you want. <laughs> I think out of like red green pawns of sideboards, there's definitely a world where like this can be like that disenchant effect. Like, you, what do they run? Cinder vines or whatever it is. Yeah. I could see wanting to run this because of the flexibility of being able to be like, all right, well, I hit two or three lands. I need to like fix my mana. I'm just gonna blow up my own land and lamp into my next lands. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think there's a lot happening on that text box, and then having flashback is even more insane. Um, not to mention like we have to do this with ghost critter, right? If you're counting what your basics your opponents have. You might get to a spot where they don't have basics to go get, and it turns back into uh, Stone Rain again. Right. So, this feels anyway. like the kind of design that's like either really, really good or really, really bad, and there's almost no in between. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm certain if this card uh, sees play, it'll be a nightmare. Otherwise, it'll be nowhere. I also think there is a world where you just play red green deck and you have four flag signs in your deck, because why not? Like Isn't there like off- a Knight of the Reliquary deck that would like run this kind of effect? No, uh, not somewhere competitive, no. Yeah, but I don't know. You know, maybe this is the push it needs. This is what it's missing. <laughs> a three mana sorcery that blows up uh almost any permanent. We'll see. Yeah, we will see. Uh, shout out to this weird frog. Moving on. Uh, the slow lands. Let's uh, move on. <laughs> no one cares about these. I mean, if you're playing control, maybe. But uh, I think there's a reason why the fast lands are good and these ones are not quite as good. Because in modern, the first couple turns are the most important. So, eh. I just don't think there's enough of a discussion to be had yeah. there. We're going to go into the uncommons and the commons, where surprisingly, I think a lot of the uh, D&T All-Stars show up here. Um, <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, man, all I'm right. all over this page, aren't I? Yeah. This uh, uh, this might be the only card of the entire list where all three of us are like, okay. I, it also might be my fault. Though. I might have, like, I might have like sneak whispered in everyone's ear about this card. <laughs> well, this is the second one that uh, we all had noted the previous one was uh, Riddle Cathar. Ah, yes. Yeah. But uh, right. I know that I know, uh, I know that, that cat mix is the one hiring this card, so just, you know, All right, here go we go. Am I, are we ready? Yeah. All right, so everyone knows how I feel about Flicker Wisp and Arbiter, like their time in our list. And, you know, and you know, I'm going to use you as testimony here off the from my, uh, from my <laughs> seminar here. But I, I keep a I keep a pretty decent record of things that make us lose and where we fall behind and this that and the other. The biggest factor I found is on turn two, playing Arbiter as your turn two play doesn't really get the same mileage in this current metagame the way it used to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm looking for replacements. And I'm finding some reasonable stuff. And then I found a common trend for us, which is we fall behind when we can't hit our lands to make sure that we can continue playing the game. This card actually does something that I had referenced to Karen's maybe a year or so ago where I said, you know, White Knight of the Orchid, I wish these cards would, um, you know, just get us the land guaranteed because then we'd be like Renin Six where we hit our guaranteed threshold for mana and we would be absolutely dominating. We wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, Ambitious resolves that. It lets us get our land guaranteed. Mm -hmm. For us, hitting a third land is, that's it. We're good. We can cast our entire deck now. Um, And that's assuming you found one copy. If you found a second copy... If you had a vial, now all of a sudden you're digging, you hit five mana, that means batter skulls are getting equipped, solitudes are getting cast, you're guaranteed to play the game. So the front part of this card is already good enough for like what our deck needs to be doing and committing. It's also like in this weird place where it's like guaranteeing that like we can take a mulligan. If I have to go down to six and then I have ambitious, that means that I can send a like say I send a hand back, my next hand is seven cards, and they're all good and I have three lands and I have one of my cards is ambitious. I can put the planes back and guarantee to draw my third planes. Like, that's a non-mulligan, so to speak, because I got to send a really easy decision back um, and get my card equity back. Mm-hmm. The last thing I want to say about this card is the Coven part. We'll activate Coven relatively easy. Actually, I have two things I want to say about this. Uh, we have uh, Coven easily activated because our creatures are on one, twos, and threes. And Coven activates at instant speed. So this could be on your opponent's turn. Even if they try to take something offline, you're going to be able to get this thing to flip. And now all of a sudden you made a 3-3 lifelinker that even if they killed your Thalia or your Wisp, now they've got to kill this 3-3 lifelinker. Um, that's fantastic. Like, I don't care. Like, any point in the game where all of a sudden my, my Farseek turned into a 3-3 lifelinker, I don't give a shit. You do the work to figure out if this is good or bad or not, opponent. <laughs> Last thing I want to say is a card that this is going to work incredibly well with it's Flicker Wisp. I hate Wisp. Like, Wisp makes me really frustrated because, like, turn three casting Wisp with nothing to do on it is really frustrating in this metagame. I feel a lot better about it if I have it going into Ambitious Farmhand, where I can just, like, play this drop, play Flicker Wisp, go get an extra land, and be ready to trigger Coven. Like, these are all fantastic places to be. So, um, the reason I said I wanted to use Offbeat for Testimony I had said to Offbeat, I said, I guarantee if you're paying attention to your games, a lot of your games you're losing are due to your mana. Do you want to say anything about that, Offbeat? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll say, you know, uh, me and Kevin were in a call about, like, a few days ago or so, and, uh, you know, he was like, bruh, and with his farmhand, this card is cracked. I'm like, come on, dude. It's not that good. 
And of course, he's like, he's like, whatever, man. Catch you later. So I pieced out, finished my league. Uh, did not get the 4-1. Got the 3-2 because I lost to uh, Living End, I believe. No, to um, uh, Char, uh, uh, Char, uh, Char Belcher Combo. Because I couldn't find my last land to, or my, my third land to wisp away their lands and, and just stone ring them. And uh, it did get me thinking. I was like, well, you know, if we had the third land, we might have won. Uh, and it did, and it did, it, 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 uh, what, what's occurred to me is that, um, through the evolution of the taxes deck, I'm just going on, on, on a, like, tangent here, uh, the, well, yes, I know, I, uh, I know me and many others have complained that the three drop spot is too crowded, we have too many good cards there, which is kind of hilarious, and we're complaining about not having enough spots in the three drop slot for all these, uh, fancy tech cards that we, that, that we all, like, want, want to, like, run, um, before it seemed like in the olden days, you know, before Summer Mystic was unbanned and we were running like Blade Splicer and shit, our important cards were at the two drop spot, right? We were trying to get Thalia down, trying to get Arbor down, trying to like ghost quarter them. And then uh, as time evolved, we got both Archon and Skyclave Apparition. Um, and we got Stoneforge Mystic, which makes our uh, uh, third, and then in the, in the case of, 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 of Stoneforge Mystic specifically, the fourth land drop for like sort of Fire and Ice. Way more important than it used to be, right? Uh, before, our three drops were like a Blade Splicer and like Flicker Wisp. And I can't remember what else we played in the three drops. So probably nothing. Um, but now, getting to three mana is very important. There's a lot of games where I've lost because I've not been able to go Planes, Skyclick Apparition, right? It's been like, oh, sorry. So I got two lands. Can't do it. Lost the game to Hammer Time because I couldn't get my Skyclick out on a curve. Um... So, I mean, this is where this card shines, I think, is, yeah, just getting that third land drop is very important for us, and uh, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know that Cat Mix is speaking from a 60-card perspective. Um, I know, of course, from the 80-card uh, Master Race, um, and and I think this card is, is, is even more valuable, because in 60, right, you get your third land drop, you're done. Unless you're going to hard cast Badish or or something, you're, you're pretty much set. But for Yorion, the fourth land drop is important. The fifth one is is important. Even the sixth, seventh uh, are also great. Because then you can start casting Ameria's Call, uh, Calder Complete, uh, Yorion. Um, I mean, the Coven part is is neat. It's like a gravy. Um, Chemix already touched on how we our our curve does tend to kind of naturally carve out into like one, two, three. Um, but also things like Batter Skull. Uh, is is four power. Uh, Caldra is five power. Um, Yorion's four power. So I mean, there's a lot of cheeky ways you can transform this. Um, and then just get a through the life linker. That I mean, like. I just want to say real quick. Yeah. I don't mean to cut you off, but it's also kind of like flashback because your opponent's not going to kill ambitious farmhand. Yeah. That's not a card on their radar. So like, you're going to get to continue playing your game naturally and threaten to flip this when they're not expecting to have to deal with it. That's the thing, yeah. yeah. This is one of those cards where your opponent is never going to feel good getting rid of it. It's like, wow, I have to remove a fucking Farseek? Like, <laughs> you know, like, like imagine your opponent's face when they down to Renin 6 to kill this thing. Like, who wants to do that? Nobody wants to do that. I mean, they don't even have the opportunity, right? Because, like, it costs two. By the time you play it, you get the third, which means you can actually activate coven provided you have the three different powers mm -hmm. so like depending on what your board state looks like and how long they may or may not have waited to activate the ren and six down tick um like again yeah. being able to do this in response to a removal spell or in response to a ping is actually a pretty big deal yeah yeah like yeah like, or, de de definitely <laughs> for, yeah, like, if they just like forget about it then it's like whatever i'm just, I'm just gonna go with this, this like this like useless one one Right. I'll I'll just deal with deal with it later, and then later shows up, and they're like, "Oh shit, I actually can't deal with this three life link anymore." I mean, I don't think it's going to be like super easy to activate Coven no. all of the time, but uh, you know, we were joking earlier about Wall of Resurgence, which just like gives you a zero and a three, and like if you curve Ambitious Farmhand into Wall of Resurgence, you just can, you can turn this on easily. There it is. Um, now so that's like, a combo. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, there I mean, again. By the time this thing comes down on turn two, you've gotten your value out of it. Uh, but if it sticks the board, it just it's a it's a pesky card. And you know, uh, to Cat Mix's perpetual point, it's embarrassing to remove. Mm -hmm. So you know your opponent's not gonna not gonna like having to go after this, and you got your value out of it by getting another land. 
we're a pretty mana hungry deck, all things considered. We want to be re equipping swords, re equipping batter skull, bouncing batter skull, re equipping cauldra, and um, farmhand helps us get there. Yeah. It's, it's more than even just like the, the luxury of getting to these high end spells, it's less non games for us. Yeah. And that's the that's the biggest point I wanna make is like we spend two mana trying to make our opponents have non games <laughs> when in reality like playing a two drop two two that doesn't advance our board game anymore is not where like modern is anymore. There's not a lot of fetch heat. Like and um I had been sharing this in conversation with people, but like we played Arbiter for the Ponza plan, not for the search heat. Because the search hate only worked when you got two to three of these things on board to make it so that you could stop a big effect from happening. Most of these decks are so mana, like, thriving. Like, Urza Saga still just pay the two. They just skip. You basically play an Arbiter says, skip making your second construct. <laughs> yeah. Or or there's nothing in your deck that you care about, so you make the second construct and move away from the search part anyway. Um, so I think we care about the Ponza side of the card more. And I think even Mind Sensor does a better job on the Ponza side. So I'm in a spot where, like, I'd love to just put Ambitious Farmhand where I had Arbiters and then squeeze even Mind Sensor somewhere on the top end to continue the Ponza plan. Yeah. And then if and then play, play the variant side of hate. Like, yeah, I mean, hopefully it's in the top four of your cards. Like, wasn't going to stop you with an Arbiter anyway. At least now we'll just do a variant check of whether you can get the card or not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, and 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 I think it's it's even better in in Yorion than it is in in sixty because Arbor is worse in Yorion, right? You're not always going to find your Ghost Quarters, aren't you? You're not always always going to find your Field of Ruins, um, and so some of those those two cards in your like eighty card deck, like I know like lull consistency, um, but but uh, I mean I'm already off Arbor, right? I'm I'm fucking jamming Squadron Hawk for, for God's sake, <laughs> so. Uh, I think yeah. in in eighty, this is an easier replace for Arbiter. In sixty, maybe a little a, 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 a little bit harder, but still uh, a, a relevant swap. I think. I think you guys have some really cool options. I think wisping this thing feels good. I think mm -hmm. like using Ephemerate to save a solitude. Your opponent's board is clear, and you have this thing on board now. Like you could just use it to go get more lands, like and not have to have a weird turn where it's like, oh no, like I don't get to save my solitude. But all right, well, I'll just hit the farm hand and go get more lands. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think Farmhand's really good for us. Um, I've done some weird, like, solo kind of, like, I just built my 60 and shuffled to see what it looks like. Yeah. And it's insane how many times this card comes up, like, um, you know, Aether Vial, cast this thing, get your third land, play your three drop, Vial in a second one. I've hit five lands. I'm hard casting swords with Equip, and, like, it's it's a really big deal. Like, this is so... It's so hard for us to see it because we see it as an uncommon, and the coven part seems like it's really important i'm going to share something that me and uh, karen's talked about this is the only coven card that doesn't check on the uh, activation of coven and, or check on the resolution mm -hmm. so like all the other coven cards like you go into combat is coven's triggered you get to do this thing this card you activate it and you, it doesn't care if you have coven anymore or not yeah yeah, it's got the the like tech edge text where it's like as long as they have you know as long as you've met x thing you know it you know, do 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 your bit, and uh, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah so, so there's there's two advantages here. So it's actually the only Coven card that has a backside, which is interesting. So this is the only okay. card that, in the set that flips, uh, you know, with, with a, an activated ability criterion. And the fact that it only checks on activation is relevant for the same reason that, like, the Tectonic Edge text is relevant. Um, so... It doesn't matter what happens on resolution. So your opponent, like for example, doesn't have an opportunity to respond. Once this thing is on the battlefield, if you have three creatures and you activate it, your opponent can't like remove a creature and turn off Coven, which turns out to be a problem for like the other Coven cards. Because if you cast a card with Coven and your opponent responds to that card by removing one of your important creatures, by the time the spell resolves, you'll no longer get the Coven effect. Yeah. This is the only this is one of the only cards where like that doesn't matter because you know this only checks on activation so by the time you pay for it the effect is going to happen you know I, i'm telling you guys like this out of this entire set it's the only one that i actually pre-ordered was ambitious farmhand like the other cards i'm going to take my time getting to but i pre-ordered a place of this because like i'm absolutely certain this just goes where arbiter was like without a question yeah. um it's a good card it's hard to evaluate and look at on the surface I think even if you just built this on X Mage and played around with it, you would see what I'm talking about. But this is That's kind of like, wild. what was that? 
Anyway. Uh, thanks. Just, uh, I yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely a card that I mean, uh, keep your eye out on it. Uh, it could, it could be great, it could be bad. I think it'll be uh, good, honestly. But um, let's uh, move on now. Uh, I think we've said all that there has uh, to be said about this card. We're all, we're all, we're all gushing over it, dude. Card is sick. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. The card is good. But uh, now let's uh, turn over to uh, Karen's, who wants to talk about uh, t uh, tiny reinforcements. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just figured I'd mention exactly that. that it's two-thirds of a timely reinforcement. So you pay two-thirds the mana, you get two-thirds the life, and you get two-thirds the creatures. Um, and, of course, the difference is, is you potentially have an upside to draw a card. I don't think that's really going to be relevant. Most of the decks that run timely reinforcements have more cards than you anyway. Uh, but it's just worth noting that this is tiny reinforcements. And uh, that card sees some play. This card may see some play. I don't know if it makes the cut or doesn't, but it's worth noting. Yeah, I uh, uh, do like the, that they like tacked on uh, draw a card, <laughs> which I mean I don't know how how, how relevant uh, this is because usually these effects are played in like control decks and they're gonna have a bunch of cards in hand. But I mean, yeah, hey, I if mean, you're really far behind, what... it's yeah, cycles. that's that's what I was mentioning. I mean, it's pretty good when you're hell bent or something like that, and there are definitely control matchups where you know they they run out of cards, but like it's hard for them to do that. Yeah, you know, they're losing at that point. And they're really digging. So Sunset Revelry may, in certain spots, get you back in the game or something like that. But, you know, it's slightly smaller than Timely Reinforcements and occasionally is going to be able to draw you a card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think all the same stuff. I just didn't it didn't make it to my top cards to bring up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, Crest seems fine. Seems fine. Um, uh, moving on. Uh, this uh, Cathar Commando, this is my sleeper pick. For the like set, you know, uh, Catmix is high on the farmhand. I'm high on the commando. Uh, Karens, are you are you there with me? I mean, I am, but it's because we wanted disenchant bear for a really long time, and man, this is close. It's very um, close, uh, and and I mean, in some edge cases, it's a little better, specifically against torpor orb. Um, but the fact that it's a two mana three one with flash, mwah. Well, I was I was talking to Catmix a few days ago, and I basically said this is the uh, uh, White Goblin Crater Maker, uh, which mm -hmm. is you know enters the battlefield, then like you sacrifice Crater Maker to deal two damage to something or to like, get rid of an artifact. This is basically very similar because it's got flash. It's if you want to remove something that's swinging, you can do it. You just flash it in. It's now your blocker. It's got three power. Uh, or alternatively, um, you know it's it's disenchant. So this feels to me like the White Crater Maker, and I'm. Not 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 mad about it. No, I'm I'm super happy about it. I mean, it it having flash uh, and being a three one, also just doesn't make it dead against a lot of decks. I mean, against a deck where maybe they don't play artifacts or enchantments, like this is still a reasonable card to play. To be like, all right, turn two, pass to you. They do some stuff. End step three one. You know, or or I mean, worst case scenario, ambush viper. Right? They they go dash ragavan. You're like, all right, flash in. You know, uh, uh, you know, fl uh, uh, a flash in my guy, a block, good to go. Um, but uh, yeah, the the fact that it just unconditionally destroys any artifact or enchantment is massive to me. Like, I mean, you can leave three mana up against Titan. They're like, okay, Dryad, you know, do their thing. Titan, Valga triggers on the stack. You're like, all right, flash this in, sacrifice, kill Dryad, and you're just like, you're, and and then like all of a sudden you're you're like way ahead. Uh, and 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 I mean, if there's like time, you can just flash this in on turn two, uh, untap, and be like, all right, blow up amulet. Like, yeah, I mean, I in general, I just think that this card is really versatile and really good. It mm -hmm. it swings, it carries a sword, it blows up artifacts and enchantments. This is exactly the kind of card we want to have access to. Yeah, as artifact and enchantment interaction. Yeah, and, 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 and I mean, Modern is, is rife with artifacts and enchantments currently, especially artifacts. I mean, uh, you can easily, if, uh, you know, if you're a bit behind, uh, your opponent has some Urza Saga tokens out, you can, like, flash it in, uh, block one, and then before damage, sack it to kill the other one, which, I mean, is huge. Uh, you know, it gets rid of things like, like, like Pithing Needle, uh, Opposing Aether Vials. Uh, there's, like, no limit with this card. I mean... I mean, like there's the a blades. <laughs> get the blade splicer golem. Yeah, get the blade splicer golem. <laughs> Make them really hate playing blade splicer. 
But uh, I love this card. I think what I like about it the most is that, it, is that it's main deckable. You can easily run this in your main deck and not feel bad about it. This is not just Ooh. not just a sideboard card. I Ooh. wouldn't. I wouldn't throw it in the main deck. But I, 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 mean, right. I think it's probably, really probably that's a hot card. take. But that's my hot take. This is a main yeah. deckable card if you want to main deck it. I actually think legacy players were saying they were going to main one. Yeah. Uh, but that's in the Urion pile. The, yeah, the, and they could recruit her for it, which I mean. Yeah, they can recruit her for that. Yeah, the European the European players are just like, what the fuck are you guys doing in the U.S. with all these 80 card piles? <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, I think the Legacy Discord was kind of like cool with running one of these. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out what Doom said. Um, this card works really well with Luris. Mm -hmm. He said, if at any point you were ever going to run Seal of Cleansing, this is probably just better than Seal of Cleansing. Yeah. I mean, it's a seal of cleansing um, that, 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 that swings. And Phoenix made a comparison to Kwasali Proud Mage. Yeah. From, from Mono White. Yeah. No Exalted, but, I mean, 3-1 body. That's Exalted. We all we all love a good 3-1, don't we? Well, I mean, maybe not Cadmix anymore. He's off the list train. No. But everyone else yeah. likes, it, likes a good old-fashioned 3-1. All right, what are, we, what are you jokers talking about with Gavany Dawnguard? Yeah, Karen, <laughs> I'll let you take this one. Uh, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, at various times we've been interested in Militia Bugler. Um, what's really not great about this card is that it doesn't trigger when it enters the battlefield. So, like, you don't get it right when you cast it, which is mm -hmm. kind of unfortunate. But, like, on rate, it's not a bad card. It's a 3-3 three, three for 3 mana. It has Ward 1, so your opponent, it's attacks. Your opponent has to pay more to, to um to go after it and of course this actually triggers whenever day becomes night or night becomes day uh, and then you essentially get the bugler text except you get creature card with mana value three or less not power check um, so you actually can get your flicker list or your apparition or your even mind sensor or your luris whatever it is that you have in the deck so it's actually pretty good for us but i'm not sure like in the right metagame, I'm happy to have access to it. I'm happy to try it. I don't know if this is the right metagame for it, but I definitely think this is a card worth considering and keeping in mind. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, uh, same, 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 like, thoughts. Yeah, definitely be, definitely be wary that there's no, like, ETB effect rule. You gotta, like, either violet in and cast no spells, or you gotta get it to flip naturally between day and night. Um, I'm, yeah, this card for me is just hard to evaluate because, yeah, the... As I mentioned before, uh, D&T to me seems to revolve a lot around the three drop spot, and this just digging for your three drops seems pretty good. Um, and you know, Ward One is just kind of gravy on top. I don't think that's really going to make or break the card. Uh, it's it, I think it really comes on just how often this stays alive and how often times you can get it to like flip. I mean, it's an extra layer of protection, right? So like, if you curve turn two Thalia and turn three Gavany Dawn Guard, it now costs two more mana to take the Dawn Guard offline. Yeah. So I mean, is this card good? Maybe. Uh, you know, it 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 does have better bugler text, being the mana value three or less. Um, yeah, but it doesn't grab solitude, but like whatever. Uh, so Cat being being the the king of bugler, how did you not <laughs> select this card? It needed an ETB. I think yeah. a big factor for even running like a recruiter effect is the fact that you can grab something right away. Um, yes, I love the fact that this could like continue triggering. It turns day and night on for us and whatnot. Um, but not hitting the ETB means that um, it's just it's just really it's it's convoluted. It's it's in constructed formats so it's really really tough to take advantage of it i just don't think it's going to be able to slot into a competitive place the way it's currently built it needed okay. that trigger on etb so i think that's totally fair but like doesn't that mean that the floor on the card is like you play it and your opponent immediately removes it because they have to no because you're not getting the card right away like the point i'm making is modern turns take or a game of modern is what five six turns seven turns maybe by the time you're getting to this thing and getting it to flip, like it was already really late and having a determining factor of winning the game or not. Like militia bugler matters because you go turn three bugler, go get forge tender or your sideboard hate piece that's really critical in that matchup, and it's coming down on like turn four um, through a vial or whatever the case may be. This card is like it's a lot of work, and even if they kill it, you didn't get the card you were looking for. 
You see what I mean? Like, I mean, I do, but like, it's a one for one card. So, like, from my I don't perspective, care about, I don't. I don't care about the one for one interaction. I need a graveyard heat card, and I drew a three three that didn't do anything, whether it lived or not. I didn't get my card that stops you from reanimating. <laughs> you yeah, know what so I mean? like, you, but you're thinking of it as kind of like a pseudo tutor. I'm thinking of it as just as value play, where like my opponent can't remove this card really for anything less than two mana because it's got a ward one. So even if they bolt it or something, that bolt costs two. And then I just want to you know, I want to play in the format you're talking about, but that's not the format I see. I like, mean, that's, I'm saying... that's fair. I, I think that the format is on fire, and we can talk about that later. But in general, yeah. in, a, in a normal format, in a normal game of Magic, this actually seems like it's not a bad option. All right. Well, yeah. One day. I, I that that's, the... not, that's not today. Yeah. That I is that not that today. The, the right. like, bell curve of this card is very big. <laughs> it's very wide for how good or bad this card is. You know, the, the floor is you play it, and they kill it, and it did nothing. Um, well, um, it ate a card. It, you know, it ate one, one, like, card, right? They, you know, you played a 3-3, three, three, they bolted the 3-3, three, three, moving on. Yeah, but they bolted the 3-3 three, three for two mana. It's, it's got the Thalia text on I it, guess. which is if you want to remove it, I then guess. it costs an extra mana. And then uh, the the ceiling, though, is, of course, like, you violet in. Uh, they don't have a response. It flips immediately. And then on their turn, if they don't have a removal <laughs> spell, they can't cast two spells, or it's going to flip again, and then it does the thing. I mean, that's what's hard. I find is it's hard to evaluate. I mean, there's going to be board states where, or, or board slash game states where, like this card just like pulls weight, uh, and, and and then, and then there's going to be boards where it does dick all. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I think it's I'm going to play for... it, but for how long? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I agree with, with the cat mix assessment that, uh, you know, it's going to take a little while to get online. I just think that, like, there are definitely going to be stalemates on the board where, like, this is not bad to have. I, prom I promise you, you guys are going to end up with this thing and just be like, damn, why isn't this just militia people? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and then I don't know. And, then, I, and by the time I, you get I, this I, thing... By the time you get this thing shoving somewhere where it matters, like, we'll actually get act. Like, at this point, just splash right and play Imperial Recruiter. I guess. I mean, that's. I think. I think that that's fair. But yeah. I'm actually interested in the mana value of three or less. I want like. There's a lot of effective cards in the three mana value slot. Um, yeah, but you didn't get to choose them with this card. You get to choose them with Imperial Recruiter. Yeah, no, that's 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 yeah, correct. That's uh, we we did have a comment in the chat from Phoenix. Yeah, we want to talk uh, about these other two cards. Cathar's yeah. call. <laughs> well, so I'll, uh, I'll, Cat makes you should start with. Uh, you know. Yeah, I I think this card's great. I think it's hilarious. Um, it's a bitter blossom effect that you have to stick on a creature. Um, everyone thinks I'm nuts thinking that I'm going to get an R to stick on mine, but I promise you I will. Uh, <laughs> let me, let, I, I promise you, you let me put this on a burn from Forge Tender, and I'll, I'll have all of you signing checks to me at the end of the day. All right, all like right. you, yeah, I guess the thing is going to stick to board. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I like the fact that it makes a token at the end of the turn instead of during the upkeep, which means you get to swim with the tokens. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a good card. It didn't make it to my top 10. I just love the function of the card. I think that there's a really unique aspect of this card. I'm kind of pissed that they put this flying creature in the art. Yeah, um, weird, uh, yeah, hippogriff. the arc, yeah, the arc, the griff thing. Yeah. But, um, is this card going to be played? No, I just like the concept of the card. I think that like, I don't think boggles or anything like that would ever play, but I think that this card does have a really cool, weird function someplace somewhere. Where it's really hard to get a certain type of creature off the board, and then you just are making extra bodies. Yeah, the place is draft. Yeah, that's true. And then loyal Griff. Anybody want to speak about loyal Griff, real quick? Uh, I mean, why don't you play like that? Uh, I guess it's a May ability. I don't know if that's relevant. But there, but White's had a bunch of these effects already, right? Where you play a creature and 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 then, and then return a creature back to your hand. Like, doesn't Stone Clunker just do this better? Stone Cloaker, you have to return the creature. Okay. So if Stone Cloaker is your last card, it just doesn't get to come online. All right. Are those like the like that 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 weird lion for two mana? White main lion yeah, doesn't fly. Doesn't fly though. It's not a two. -two and I think flyer. that's. I think that one's also mandatory. I think you also have to return yeah. the creature. So I don't know how good yeah, the optional that, that is. Mandatory. Card's fine. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in these type of effects. Yeah, me either. All right, you guys want to move on? Yeah, let's uh, continue forth. Uh, consider, yes. All right. Consider. Can we just talk about this 
this new art on Delver real oh, quick. On Delver? Sure, this fucking weirdo with this, like, uh, if everyone's seen the movie The Fly. Yeah. I mean, Delver was already very fly-esque, but this is even worse now. <laughs> this is fucking <laughs> face, dude. God, I hate it. Oh, man. All right, so what were you going to say about Consider Good? Yeah, so Consider, I just want to talk about, because, I mean, I think a lot of people have seen this card and have evaluated correctly that. It's going to be very strong. Uh, but I think that this card is, is, is just strictly better than Opt in every way. Uh, I don't know any deck that's going to want to run Opt over Consider. Um, the, the, the floor between these two cards, right, are you, you scry the top card and you want it, so you draw it, done. They're exactly the same card, whatever. Um, but... When you put a card at the bottom or put it into your graveyard, that's such a huge power swing in uh, favor of consider here that it's not even comparable. Like, because when you put a card to the bottom, you don't you don't really want to see it again. You don't expect to see it again. You know, unless you're like intentionally trying to shuffle it back in. But even then, like, that's are you really intending to be like, yeah, so this on the bottom, and now I'm gonna shuffle it back in later, than, and then I'm gonna draw it, and that's gonna be our our master game plan. Um, so for those decks that, that uh, want opt but don't have graveyard synergy, this is basically the same effect. Putting it in your yard or putting it into the bottom, whatever. It's a card that you don't want to see. But for the cards that do, or, or, or for the decks that do care about graveyard synergy, this is so much better than opt. It's it's disgusting. Uh, I mean, is it going to bust modern open? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, it's definitely just way better than opt. Opt is fucking garbage fire we're to consider holy shit uh i mean i mean just just look at uh fucking dragon's rage channeler uh for me i mean maybe this isn't a like hot take or anything but for me the uh surveil one on the spell casts is the powerful part of the card it's not the three three flyer part it's the it's the card filtering um and that just shows how much better dumping things into your yard is than putting them on the like bottom of of your deck so i think i think that the, the, this is probably the best blue card in the entire set uh card is busted be prepared to see it everywhere uh bada bing bada boom okay I so i do think your... that like most yeah. of the most of the decks that play opt probably want consider instead but i think that maybe a more interesting question is does this just replace opt or are they run both of them are run in the deck yeah um i mean if you're looking for ops like five to eight Maybe, but I don't think so. Uh, the, the the decks that are running Opt um, usually already have like other effects that are Opt adjacent. Um, I know that like in the case of like Murktide, they're running, uh, was it Thought Scour? Um, right, as they're like other kind of one mana like cantrip. Uh, I think some of them are also running like, like Serum Visions. Um, this won't replace Serum Visions because they need the sorcery for like Delirium. Um, and Thoughtscar fills up the yard better for Murktide, but uh, I think consider for those decks definitely replaces Opt. Um, for like traditional control decks, I mean, if if your deck is running Snapcaster Mage, I mean not I mean not too many decks are, but if they are, um, consider is sometimes just draw two cards because you put you know you you put a spell in your yard that that you're that you're gonna flash back anyway, and then you draw another card, um, all for one mana. Uh, so like. I mean, potentially, potentially so. I, uh, yeah, my guess is is you're probably right that you know, most of the time, consider replaces opt, and I don't know how many of the decks actually want opt five through eight, but it is interesting that they gave uh, opt a slight upgrade. Yeah, I don't look forward to looking at this shitty art, but sure. Fucking <laughs> dude, this eyeglass telescope on his face. Don't worry, <laughs> it'll it'll only be five seconds before you get a consider <laughs> secret layer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. I mean, this makes Turtle Storm have enough cantrips to go off now, but yeah, let's move. Let's move on. Yeah, <laughs> move, moving on here. Um, I don't know if Lexi will play this, but I mean, Modern doesn't have the shit that like Lexi has. But uh, moving on, another one for me. I'm I'm the one covering these weird monocolored cards, but uh, Infernal Grasp. We got uh, Doomblade, but better. This is like the final form of Doomblade. I feel like Wizards has uh, expended every possible design space of destroy target creature plus downside for two mana um so it definitely seems like that wizards has decided that destroy target creature effects in black are worth two and a half mana 
right? You either have three mana for like murder or murder with upside, or you have two mana doom blade with like a downside. Um, and I mean, you know, we've had non-black creature, we've had freaking like non-merfolk creature, we've had uh, non-legendary <laughs> creature, we've got it all. But now we finally got lose two life. Yeah, go for the throat, non-artifact creature. Yeah, go for the throat, not artifact. Uh, yeah, cast down, popper all star. Um, but yeah, now we got finally just lose two life, which I think is an extremely reasonable cost for kill anything. Um, I wish this was white, because I mean, uh, I would probably play this if it was in white. Um, doesn't kill planeswalkers though, so I, so I don't know how it really compares to uh, the the the. Uh, uh, deck and stone two um and i know that like two mana is is big and modern right i know you know everyone's playing fatal push or like dismembered or one mana but i mean this is two mana kill anything and for the low low price of two life just shock can yourself we, or shock, uh, god can we can we stop wishing for subpar cards and white we, we already get enough of those can't they just That's give fair. us swords of plowshare yeah we have the card we just Want them to print it into our form. Just give us two mana swords of plowshares. No, just speed. give no, 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 no. Just give me swords of plowshares. Come on, we gotta, we gotta be reasonable here. We gotta just be asked for swords that of plowshares. We'll never get that. Is that is reasonable. They just made prismatic ending. I'm not too concerned about swords of plowshares right. anymore. Swords can never hit eight for mile. Yeah, so I'm not sure what decks play this. I would imagine probably just the the regular black decks that you would expect. Um, things like uh, red black Luris, I can see running this. Um, uh, any kind of control decks running black, I can see them running this. Um, maybe alongside Dam, you know, some sort of mix. I don't know if any deck will run four of these, but I think this being like Fatal Push's copy, or, or it, uh, this might be better than like the fourth copy of Fatal Push. Um, and and I know that we're gonna see it. Like it's this is gonna be in modern. I'm I'm certain. Um, All right, moving along. Yeah, as <laughs> as as Phoenix mentioned, yeah, and like. Minus two life is fun for like your shadow decks. Uh, moving on, it's it's me again. Look, we're on a, we're on oh, a big man. off the hero streak. We're talking about play with fire. I won't take up the whole stream. Um, hey, I, I thought say, we had a schedule to keep over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got a schedule. Everything's flagged. I know. I've got, I've got all these shitty cards that I was going to play as flagged. I was laughing at me. Be like, dude, come on. What are you doing over here? But uh, I feel like play with fire. Um, mostly because. Uh, I don't know if Burn wants this. It is Shock, you know, in a deck that plays Bolts. Um, but Scry 1, not irrelevant. Uh, I know a lot of Burn players lose because they draw too many lands. You know, they gotta, like, filter their, like, uh, draws or whatnot. So, I mean, will Burn play this over... I would say maybe, maybe this could replace... Um, uh, Light of the Stage. You know, some of the card selection cards that Burn is playing that, that, that isn't dealing damage. I mean, sure, Light of the Stage gives you uh, two cards that, that you can play, play right away, but those could be lands. They, you know, they like, could be dead. They could be like Rift Bolts or something that you can't suspend from like Exile, you know, shit like that. Uh, and, and play with Fire Left to Scry. Is that better? Maybe. I don't know. So I'm, I'm over here, uh, you know, giving you shit, but I've actually, I'm on here. <laughs> I'm, I'm hard to see, but I'm the little blue flag next to cathartic pyre oh you are yeah i'm uh it's uh i i was talking to cat a couple days ago and uh cat makes called it uh what was it uh mono red is it charm is that <laughs> yeah. correct uh, yeah yeah i mean i just think it's worth noting that it is mono red is it charm yeah. and you know you might find it in phoenix deck somewhere or something like that again it's not quite faithless looting but of course you know it is interesting that this one's templated like discard up to two cards and then draw that many cards so like you're not screwed if you have a last card in hand that you'd like to keep, uh, or you know, you know, if you're on. I have a question three about cards this card. And you're going down to one or something like that, so you're not screwed. You don't have to lose it. Uh, I have a question about this, real yeah. quick. Yeah. Is there any reason, like, I don't remember the text box on text box on it? Is there any downside to this as far as cathartic reunion? Like, will you just run this instead of? I mean, cathartic. cathartic uh, what draws you three cards instead of? Yeah, instead cathartic of two? draws you three. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, this is this is actually uh, the user charm. I mean, you you got it right yeah. the first time. So cool. I just was I, I don't know. As we sat here and started talking about draft cards, I had a random brain fart about what was happening here. Well, I'm I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm hard to see the little uh, blue flag there, but uh, you know, mono red is a charm worth pointing out. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if... I'm just touching your boss. Yeah, see, I don't know if, like, Dredge plays, plays this, just, like, flexibility. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some decks that will that will play this in some capacity somewhere. Yeah. All right, let's move along. Moving on. No one cares about green cards. Green let's is keep, off the menu today. Let's, let's keep moving. Um, we have some multi-star comms and comms. We're talking about Faithful Mending. Sorry, we can't move on Cadmix. So me and, me and uh, Karen oh, have sorry. our eyes on uh, the yeah. new Faithless Looting. Colorblind over here, sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's another good callback, right? Faithless Looting, now Faithful Mending. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that made Faithless Looting really powerful, I mean, there's two things that made it really powerful. First is that it uh, cost one mana, and the second is that you could flash attack from the graveyard, which really enabled like graveyard strategies to put it in the graveyard and then use it again. Um, Faithful Mending is like downshifted in power a little bit um, because it now costs two mana instead of one. But we basically have another version of uh, Faithless Looting back. And of course, the, another major drawback for this card is that it's in white and blue and not mono red. So I don't know if it's going to see play or not. You know, it is instant speed now instead of sorcery speed, which I also find kind of mind blowing. It seems really good, even just in blue white control. Mm -hmm. um, but they put it back in the format. They just changed the colors, added an extra, you know, CMC to the original cost. And I don't know what that's going to do, but it's worth noting that uh, some version of Faithless Looting is back. Yeah, I think this card is very flexible. I I, I totally agree with uh, uh, I, I, what you said were the two strongest parts of. of of OG looting is yeah one mana and flashback. Um, I guess Wizards has decided that the classic draw two discard two effect is worth one and a half mana, so that's why we get this like gain two life part of it. It's got to be like feels looting with like upside if it costs two mana. Um, and yeah, I I, I think I think instant really is the backbreaker on this card because I mean, will Dredge play it? Maybe, probably, right? The the neat part about looting in Dredge, right, is that if you dredge over it, you can still play it, which this does, but only for three mana. I believe the flashback on looting was like four mana or something. Um, but I think this also finds a home in reanimator decks because now instead of um, discarding on your own turn, because a lot of draw discard effects that are cheap are sorcery speed. Um, but now, if you're in like Esper, uh, in in uh, uh, Esper reanimator colors, you can easily just wait to your opponent's turn, see if they draw a breast piece or 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 like some of the grave hate, and if they don't, you dump your shit in the yard, untap, reanimate, right? And there's very little chance to to to, to act try, or, or try to do anything unless they have like uh, cling to dust or something, right? Um, and and even just as like a value card in control decks, not bad. Like hey, uh, you know you have a shitty hand, um, but you got faith. But you got faithful mending. You can easily recover by just like end step, faithful mending, gain two life, get some new cards, uh, get back in the game. Um, and then of course flashback for three is super good. So I guess if you really want to, you could go end step mending, untap, play a land, flash it back that turn, um, for the, which 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 I think is huge. Um, Hopefully it's not. Yeah, I, it's would not just, too I would just I would just keep an eye on it and uh, let's keep going. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, artifacts. Um, I like this pumpkin. This pumpkin's fun. Um, this field ruin art is really sick. Yeah, field of ruin new foil options. That's yeah. gonna be good for some cats just joining into field of ruin territory. Mm -hmm. All right, let's let's see what we got next year. Yeah, only one more arc and you can run a full playset of mismatched field of ruins. You can uh, paging, paging Jake wherever he is. Can you? You can run the, the time shifted one. Well, oh, I guess like not the old art, order. It's, yeah, but it's, nah, def it's definitely different. I, right, want, I want different art. Though. I want different art. Yeah, we'll get there. But yeah, almost. We're very close. Um, and now that is the set. Uh, so we're talking about uh, set overall. Um, Cadmix, what do you think? Is this just some draft chaff? Is this gonna break modern? What's the verdict? Uh, I'm going to look at it uh, twofold. I'm going to look at it from a competitive standpoint and then just from flavor. Uh, I think flavor-wise, it feels very Innistrad. I really like it. There's some really cool callbacks. Um, the cards are exciting to look at. You know, getting our Fiend Hunter uh, push up the rare, the callback to Faithless looting, Hostel Hotel doing an Ormenthal, or not Ormenthal, the uh, Westvale Abbey impersonation. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of really cool pieces there, so I like the look and feel of the set. 
from a competitive standpoint, there's a handful of cards that I think are actually going to have impact on Eternal Formats, Commander, and, um, you know, uh, the rotating or non-rotating sets, however Wizards is identifying them now. So I'm going to say this set's a win. I'm going to go ahead and agree with Catmex. I mean, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time reiterating everything you said, but I'm a fan of the flavor. I think it's a win. And uh, there's certain cards that are probably going to make a constructed splash. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's a particularly, you know, particularly pushed set, which mm -hmm. is actually good given how pushed the sets have been recently. And so I think it's, you know, all in all, pretty well balanced. Seems good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, same kind of sentiments. I mean, I think there's a card in here for, for like, any Magic player, whether you're playing Legacy or Commander or, like, whatever. Um, uh, flavor's fun. I, I do like how kind of gruesome it is. There's a lot of, like, kind of gross cards in this set that, like, I'm like, damn, it's kind of nasty <laughs> when I, like, look at the art. Um, and it feels like a nice break because I feel like the last few sets have all been kind of, like, you know, high fantasy stuff. You know, we had the we had the, the 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 like Viking set. We had the Godzilla set. We had the like fantasy set. We had the D and D set. But we had this like weird, grim, dark set where you have like art with like some some gnarly ass zombies on it. So uh, it's it's definitely sick. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's any one card that I see that's like gonna like break modern. Where I'm like, fuck, like I don't want to deal with like Earl all over again. Um, so it's fun. I like it. It's it's cool. Cool. So we have one last bit we have to do here, which do. is a is a favorite of mine. I like to revisit the ban list after a new set comes out and just see are we still speaking the same language? Is Wizards holding back, or is everything that's on there supposed to be on there? So we're gonna take a quick peek here. Yeah. Let's see if there's any Stoneforge Mystics still on the ban list. All right. So we have one white card still banned. <laughs> Uh, artifact so, lands. So okay. I feel like we gotta get uh, Second Sunrise unbanned just so that we can see that, that there's no white pips on the ban list. So from, like I, Ancient I, Den. Unban Ancient Den too. <laughs> I don't think Second Sunrise can get unbanned. No, it can't. It's it's got the Sensei's top problem, which is it's not too powerful. It's just incredibly boring. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look in the lands. Mm -hmm. Um, I just there's one land I wanna at least generate the conversation or argument around. Is Dark Depths supposed to still be banned in Modern? Is that real? I mean, it's basically uh, what's the Thespian Depths, right? That's the combo that yeah. we're all worried about, or yeah. x Mage Depth? Yeah. Is yeah, that yeah, real? I, I mean, does, yeah. does Titan need that boost? Because it goes in Titan decks, right? Or a new deck? No other existing deck plays Dark Depths, right? I mean, here's, you might a couple extra decks that pop up. Here's my concern, though, is, like, it doesn't do anything fast enough to be scary. Like, the token can be stolen by Archmage's Charm. It can be bounced by any and everything. It can get Solituded. It can get Flicker Wished. Um, literally every color except for black, I think, has, like, a generic way to deal with the card. So, like, it hosing exactly one color is kind of, like, bleh, whatever. Um, like, I don't know. I, I think it's slow, and I think it's fine. It's a legendary land that it's it, to me it feels way less dangerous than urza saga but i don't know i could be wrong yeah I, I i guess it just depends on like uh what is modern missing that makes the legacy lands deck good is it just crop rotation crop rotation uh i mean you can sylvan uh sylvan scrying as an impersonation of right crop rotation so like it's I mean, slower it doesn't have exploration exploration I mean, yeah, there's a lot of have, we don't have uh, Mox, uh, Mox Diamond. Well, well, yeah. no, there's also a, there's also a Mono Black Dark Depths deck that literally just hand disrupts yeah. and then plays Vampire Hex Mage to pop it off early. Which could be a modern deck. Yeah, but I mean, again, that's not, I don't hate that. Like, I'm not mad at losing to the Merit Mage token. I think that that's a fine interaction. It doesn't feel any worse than getting pummeled by Murktide, <laughs> uh, you know, over the course of two turns with even less agency. Does it I mean, make I modern better though? I mean, that's yes, a question, right? If you're if you're if you're taking a card off the ban list, I, I I mean I mean in my opinion, it should make modern better. Does having I dark think, depths dot deck make it better? I think so. I think having a deck that polices other 
weird agency decks is good. I mean, that's my opinion. But it also means that people have to play stuff like Ghost Quarters and Stone Rings and Magus of the Moons and Archmage's Charm, which means interaction again. I don't know if you guys remember what that's like, but having to interact is pretty insane. I think someone just literally typed that in there. Or no, someone <laughs> yeah, said we don't have it. Yeah, what's, what's interaction again, and why yeah. do we care? Yeah. Um, what's an opponent? Like, yeah, I think that, like, um, we're sort of driving at a kind of, like, meta question. I'm starting to lose faith. I mean, like, I've long since lost faith, I guess, but I'm just going to say it again. I, I'm losing faith in Wizards' ability to manage a ban list. Like, I don't think, obviously, there's a lot of cards on here that, like, deserve to be banned, but the cards that we've seen come into the format, certainly in the last two years, some of them are just... Um, really oppressive and it kind of like restricts what's playable in the format kind of way. We've seen significant changes, significant turnover in what's supposed to be a non-rotating format. And so um, I think that what's weird to me about the ban list today on a kind of like big picture level is that there's cards that should be on here that aren't on here. And then there's a handful of cards on the ban list that like, I I'm not sure exactly what they're doing or I'm not sure if they're as powerful as they once were. Like, I don't necessarily want those cards to come off, but, like, in, l in light of all the things that are going on in the format right now, they just seem silly to have on the ban list. And so I have consistency issues with the ban list, um, and I think that's a bigger picture question. Yeah. All right, let's, let's move along. Blue, I don't think there's anything worth talking. No, unless you guys disagree. There. Yeah, the multicolored, same thing. I don't think there's anything on there. That's yeah. surprising. Black, I mean, Karen, you have a weird take with Bridge from Below. You feel like that card actually doesn't belong on the list, right? Uh, I mean, I'd have to, like, I mean, what got it banned, so Bridge was, as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't uh, Bridge die for Hogak Sins? That is correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, I don't like Bridge. I don't think that Bridge is, like, a well-designed card, but, like, it's the same issue as like Death Red Shaman gets printed and then they ban Bloodbraid Elf and then they eventually like unban Bloodbraid Elf. Mm -hmm. Like if Bridge isn't the problem card and it just gets you get rid of it as splash damage, I don't know that it necessarily belongs there. But again, I don't I don't think it's a well designed card. I don't think it's super healthy. We now have like a, is it Dementia Alter? Whatever the yeah, thing to make it Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like I don't know. I don't I don't love it coming off, but like when one card when the wrong card gets banned uh i just have questions about whether or not it's supposed to stay there when the right card eventually gets banned yeah i don't think it needs to come off the list i think it's degenerate and bad for the game uh phoenix asked about dread return yeah. i don't think dread return can ever come off the ban list i don't think um, it can either dread right. return is really the thing that makes uh, like the dredge decks go like being able to like sacrifice your narco mebus or sacrifice your you know it was bridge but with other things but like sacrificing your narco mebus sacrificing your blood gas sacrificing your whatever to put some giant beefy thing like i don't know iona back on the battlefield is yeah. just really nasty okay yeah and that's a like i wasn't around was was dread return banned from the outset of modern or the band later uh, it was banned and it's extended i think yeah i think it's it was banned really really early i can't remember yeah, the initial cause... set of bands so like the way, when modern got started it was announced in like i don't know maybe may or june or something like that and they didn't finalize a ban list till the end of the summer okay, and i okay. think it was banned in the second round of bands at the end of the summer we've never um, seen it in modern it's like we've never yeah Okay, yeah, because yeah, like did. I've I've never played against Dread Return. I don't know why it's there, but I don't even know why it would come off. I'm 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 just blind to this card. I have no idea. Like and Legacy, how this like you can stuff. play. You play Manalist Dredge. The the part that's a kick in the nuts with this is Dredge right now can't just throw random twenty CMC cards in it because like it functionally has to operate a certain way. Mm -hmm. You put Dread Return into the format, and then they can just mill their Dread Returns throw them, pitch them back with their cathartics and whatnot, and then just pitch their gristle brands or their Ionas or whatever it is, and just, it doesn't cost them anything to run a Dread Return and okay. sack the Narc Amoebas and the Blood Gas that all would come back anyway. Like, it's just free reanimator inside of your Dredge deck. Right. So, yeah, just to, put, just to put a fine point on that, I mean, picture, you, you consider you're, you're playing against Dredge. How long does it take Dredge to get three creatures on the battlefield? Usually not that long. Sometimes it's turn two. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so, like, 
when Dread Return is in the yard and they have three creatures on the battlefield, they can reanimate anything in their yard. So what happens is, is they basically, like, they have Dread Return and, like, some giant beefy thing that's really nasty. It could be Iona, it could be, like, Jingataxius, it could be, like, whatever it is that they want to do that's really mean. Um, it's usually not Jingataxius, it's usually, like, Archon. Of, um, I can't remember, Blazing Archon? Was that the one that's, like, a... A wall. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's all bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> it's all. It's Pick all your favorite fatty. Yeah. Inkwell, yeah. Inkwell Leviathan coming in from the trees. Um, yeah. yeah. It's it's basically a giant giant. Yeah. It's the cheapest reanimator spell out there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's free. It's free. Yeah. All, all right. right. It can stay so there. So artifacts, chrome mox, mox opal, arkham, sensei's top, skull clamp. Oh baby, jit. <laughs> Yeah, uh, honorable mention for Mox, uh, or both Moxes, Top and, and Skull Clamp. Um, they are never coming up the ban list, especially with uh, Urza of Saga. And could you imagine being like Saga third no. chapter, grab Skull Clamp? I've already had to deal with half of what you just described. Yeah. And they still do the other half in Legacy. So, you yeah, know, I don't, I don't want to see this. You know, Urza of Saga, make two Karnstrocks, get Mox Oval. <laughs> Like, um, gross. Let's talk about the JIT though. The JIT still banned? Is this thing still banned? JIT's still banned. Equipping creatures too strong. I mean, I'm pretty sure that like they just forgotten it's on the ban list, right? Again, there's certain cards on here that like they were locked in jail and it was reasonable to put them in jail maybe in the beginning and like I, I don't know. Wizards has forgotten that they're there. I think JIT's going to come off. I think they're going to do it the same way they did with Stoneforge. Where like the shit falls apart, they have to make some really heavy bands, and they got to give something back. I think there's a handful <laughs> of cards. I do. I think there's a couple of cards on this ban list that are basically waiting to get unlocked as like a. Um, it's almost like a uh, secret layer. Like, okay, you guys can play with this card now. Yeah, it's the back pocket. Six, yeah, six of your toys just got taken from you. Here, have this one back. So I think Jit eventually does come our way. Eventually. I mean, um, I've, 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 I've never played JIT. I've never played against JIT, so I don't really know how strong it is. Um, reading it, in the, you know, I can see why it is powerful, but in the current landscape, um, let me tell you, the amount of times I've, I've equipped a Sword of Fire and Ice, uh, not a lot. Not a lot of games. It does happen, so but... On beat, speaking to an ancient relic of when JIT creature matchups used to be obnoxious and hard and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I disagree. I think there's so many ways to take a JIT offline right now. I think the Mono White Mirror, you're going to have Skyclaves. Um, I think, you know, Giver giving protection is a big deal. I think there's so many clean ways. Every other color combination has got, like, K commands and blah, blah, blah. Like, we don't get... The only equipment we get to stick the board now is Caudra. Like... All the other ones die on the hill every single time. My yeah. batter skulls never survive. My aether vials never survive. Yeah, we got to do a prismatic ending. I don't think that JIT actually creates a creature-based problem. I think the reason that it's banned right now is for what? Like, I don't think there's a reason to until they have to take something away. Um, I, I don't think... I don't think the game falls apart. I don't think it gets bad. They're already doing this with Walking Ballista, and they don't even have to get combat damage in. So JIT doesn't do anything that's absurd or unfair that isn't already happening in the format. Mm. It's just whether or not they want Stoneforge to fully have access to its package or not, because that's going to be who plays it. Because I promise you, any deck that's not running Stoneforge is not going to run JIT. They could just play Ballista. Any deck that's already going to do an effect like that, much rather have Ballista. Yeah. You can't show me a deck in this format that's like, Ragavan, I'm going to put a JIT in here. Like It's, it's whether they want to give Stoneforge decks to GT or not. That's yeah. it. All right. In red, I don't think there's a card in red that could, could come off, except for maybe, I think Punishing Fire, there's argument for it. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. I just think Punishing Fire is underpowered when it only deals two damage now. <laughs> and then, so we have the Eternal Splinter Twin debate. It's never come off the balance, guys. Give it up. <laughs> it's never coming off. That's that just sitting there forever. It's, it's, in my opinion, it's only gotten better. Uh, like, do, do you really want to face a Splinter Twin deck that uh, either is, you know, you can either face the uh, 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 Teferi Time Raveler version, uh, where you can't interact with it and they just kill you, or you can face the uh, fucking Veil of Summer version, which is going to stop your shit for one mana and then kill you. Uh, bruh, the card's way too good now. <laughs> like, it's just gotten better. Yeah, I'm generally not interested in the uh, oops, I win decks. Right. 
I like like your you face Splinter you Twin you when mean, they have force negation. You mean modern? Yeah. No, yeah, wait, <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. I I will see all of you in November when the next set releases. Yeah, like like do you want to play right. against Splinter Twin that's running like like grief? Like oh zero mana, discard you. All right, Splinter Twin to win the game. <laughs> Fuck that. All right, shit. Look, looking at green. Um, didn't they just reprint Glimpse of Nature? Didn't that just get printed somewhere where it's, like, essentially Glimpse? Didn't we just get that in this set and then I should have, like, a blue-green Glimpse? No, we, blue-green was, uh, back in call, and we did get one in this set, and I can't remember what color it was, but it wasn't blue-green, it was something else. It was a different color. Green, white, green. Green, white, green, green, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I still don't think we need Glimpse. I don't really care. Yeah. I'm sure elves would bought a rocket for it. Yeah, it's um, right, right, right of Harmony name of the card right right um and then uh, another card i love to think that could come off the ban list is green sun Zener. really um was it the reason yeah. it was put on was because every green deck like runs because like why wouldn't you it was they put have on the been... ban list because it's too versatile on turn one it grabs dryad arbor yeah and then and turn whatever it grabs uh you know whatever well, it's the whatever it's the big the... Name, grab I think this is the point you made earlier. I think the big hill it died on was it grabbed Death Rage Shaman. Um, I, I mean, they have... I don't think they, that was their explanation, but it certainly didn't help. At the time, that was the biggest reason. Like, Death Rage Shaman guaranteed on turn one just meant graveyards didn't function, and you basically accelerate it into an accelerant, which was real bad. If I if I had to go back in there, I'm almost positive that their explicit reason was Dryad Arbor. I'm not talking about what they're saying. I'm talking about yeah. why it was problematic. It was I like the only green... one mana like ramp card. I played Green Sun and Legacy, and I'm telling you, like you got turn one, Dryad, or you would go and get Death Rage Shaman on the draw, like, and then just so many decks couldn't play Magic anymore. <laughs> um, but Green Sun, I think, is fine. It only grabs green creatures. Um, Finale of Devastation is essentially a lot of the same effort. And it can grab any color creature, and that doesn't see play in modern. I think that green sounds great. I don't think it's too powered. I think it would be fine. I mean, do I want to play against it? Not really. But, like, there's just some cards on here that just don't make sense in the landscape of what we're looking at. Yeah. And I think green sounds one of them. I could buy it. I, you know, I never played against green... Or I, I never played against green suns. Um... I just assumed it was banned because if you're running a green deck, why wouldn't you play this card? And so every green deck plays it, and then it just becomes like I don't know, boring, I guess. Um, so in modern green sun has been banned since uh, September of 2011. Yeah, um, and that's long before uh, Death Red Shaman. Right. No, I, I know what I'm saying though is like the biggest reason for us to not have it unbanned is because of Death Red Shaman. Like. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of times where cards are coming off the list. Green Sun was not even an option the entire time that Death Rate Shaman existed. Like, look at how many times they pushed around not banning Death Rate Shaman, like planning Blood Braid off the side and the other. Like, I'm saying this is another card that gets shoved out of the file or conversation because so much of the time that it was in consideration was while Death Rate was still around. So I think it catches the same heat that a lot of other cards on the list caught, where it's just like, we can't think about this card because there's already all this other weird shit we're dealing with. And then it just moves out of the file of the conversation. See, I don't. Know. I've I I think I do agree with uh, Andy at chat. What like on beat villain and uh, Joom are saying that uh, it just makes Titan like so much better. I mean, on turn one, uh, they can just go grab uh, the the fucking sloth, right? That's not no, a can't. terrible pickup, actually. They um, can't grab the sloth because oh, they'd be casting it for zero. Yeah, turn turn two. You know, but sure. turn one they could still go go get Dryad. Turn two they could grab Sloth. Down the line, I mean, this is just, I, I mean, I've I, I, uh, uh, Titans are not very good right now. Thank goodness, cause I hate playing against that deck. But uh, I've already complained that that deck is running like twelve copies of Titan already. You know, it's got like the the four copies of Titan. It's got the Summers Pact. It's got the Tellurio Wests. It's got that stupid double face card now. And then adding this into like I I just don't want that. What do you have to take out to get to it, though? Like, everything has a cost, right? Like, yeah. to gain something, you have to lose something. Um, I don't know. I, I I think Green Sun Zenith has a space in Modern that could be fun. Uh, I think there's so many cards that... Uh, there's so many things that you have to look at contextually. Like, there's pillars to everything. Everyone thought Stoneforge Mystic was going to ruin Modern by coming back. Yeah. Is Stoneforge a strong card? It sure is. 
Is it broken? No. I think if Green Sun becomes a powerful card, then it forces people to reevaluate what pillars of the format are important. Is it countering the Green Sun Z? Is it search hate? Is it not being too concerned about what creature they could get? Is containment priest all of a sudden a good card again? Like I think all these things shove and pivot and move the metagame around. It's just whether or not we want to move the metagame around around this effect or not, if it ends up being that powerful. I yeah. think that like the consideration on Wizards part is like Green Sun is a card that does resi- does restrict design space for green cards. Um, I know that's sort of a cop out, but, but like I think that they have to decide whether they want to push card designs that they're developing or they want to unban Green Sun Zenith. And so, uh, I mean, imagine a format where you had like Uro and Green Sun in the, you know at the same time. I mean, it would have been crazy. I mean, it was bad enough with just Uro, but of course the problem here is Uro and not Green Sun. So, I just think that they have a new ban philosophy that allows them to test these waters a little bit more liberally. Like they can choose to ban things on any given Monday, and they've done that with Grave. Uh, what is it? The Golgari Grave Troll. Yeah. Ban, they banned, unlocked it. Unbanned, banned again. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, that just but that just gets back to my earlier point about there's consistency issues with the ban list, where like it's not clear that certain cards on the ban list are more powerful than what's going on in the format. There's no actual real, like re. Reevaluation of the cards on the ban list, or at least not a not a regular reevaluation of the cards on the ban list. They basically put cards on the ban list and then forget they're there. Yeah, I mean, I think... we can all agree that uh, I mean, in my opinion, the card that does not deserve to be on the ban list the most is probably Mycosynth Lattice. This card is That's... on here specifically because of Karn the Great Creator. That is it. Well, I mean, like they can't. They need to ban one of them. That's what I mean. They're leaving Karn in the format. It's like, like. Like, this card is literally unplayable before Karn. It was, like, you know, a, a like, 10 cent rare. No one played it. And then Karn came out, and then, oh, the win the game. I mean, Karn Punishing out. Fire is unplayable without Grove of the Burn Willow. I guess. I, you know, I would just, uh, but but I would think that, like, you know, there are other ways to play Punishing Fire. There's no way to play Mike's at Lattice. No one's playing it. <laughs> Like and and they just didn't ban Karn because it was like the hot you know it was it was it was the like brand new hotness. So to they, be fair though, I think I think Karn, as much as he was obnoxious, is way less obnoxious now. I think I newer guess. printings of, uh, of, of of I mean I hate it, Karn. I have like a vendetta, so I mean maybe I'm just biased. I you know I just want Karn but, on the ban list. Now that all my artifacts don't have equip costs and just swing from the trees, I don't really care anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um. But I, I just I think that we've evolved past it being dangerous with Skycrave Apparition, Cauldra. Um, I, I, again, I'm never going to sit here and say that the design of the card is good, but I think it reminds me a lot of Stoneforge Mystic where its its existence isn't not fun. There was a big period of time for us it was unfun, right? Like, people were getting in staring bridges. We didn't have outs for all this shit. Yeah. I think now we're in a spot where, like, we can mitigate and manage a lot of, like, what Karn's out there trying to do. To me, it's fine now. It feels fine. Um, Microsoft Lattice still being around would make that less fun. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> because yeah. Because then they could just like, jam the Lattice and then draw another card. And then yeah, it. I do agree that, that yes, they, they can't exist in the same format. I'm just saying that that this card, you know, if if Bridge died for Hogak Sins, Microsoft Lattice definitely died for Karn Sins, like 100%. Yeah, I and just I think, think that's... Yeah, that's true. I think it's fine now. Yeah, I don't know that it, it really matters because, like, Mycosynth Lattice wasn't seeing any play whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Which, um, like, which I guess is why they, like, abandoned it because, I mean, like, Karn works independently from, from Lattice. If you if you ban Karn, you are essentially banning Lattice as well because, I mean, no one's playing it. I mean, that's correct. So I guess that's why they banned Karn. But. I also think that, like, for this same argument, it's hard to say that we feel good about one thing, but like Green Sun stays on. Like Karn being unbanned, Stoneforge eventually getting unbanned, but Green Sun has to stay banned. While there's finale of Des- devastation in Modern, to me it's just it, it makes no sense to me. So that's that's why I look at like the consistency thing, right? Like mm-hmm. Green Sun needs to be here, but these other cards got unlocked back into the format. Yeah, yeah. Part of me wants to say that like Blazing Shoal is probably okay too, just because Infect is the worst it's ever been. But does it make the format better? I don't think so. So I don't really care about Blazing Shoal. 
right? Because um, it was banned because of the like the like turn to infect win, right? They they play fucking listener off turn one, turn two they like exile some nine mana red card and they bash you for ten, and you lose the game, right? I'm not sure I'm excited for Blazing Shoal because like we already have enough weird shit going on with like prowess type strategies, and like now we have the Pokemon. Like my opponent just like buying Obosh. And You're afraid of Obosh to... Blazing Shoal? <laughs> yeah. And then you're getting prowess triggers off of it. Blazing Shoal was originally banned because of Blazing Shoal Infect, which was a popular deck uh, right at the inception of the format. Um, And they decided to put it on the ban list basically immediately. Uh, But yeah, at the time, you would have some Infect creature and you would Blazing Shoal pitching Progenitus. Yeah. And uh, that would be your win condition. I know. What I'm saying, though, is like in like prowess esque type strategies. Being able to just put four blazing shoals in there and then run Obosh, <laughs> and then just Oboshing to your hand and pitching the Obosh to a blazing shoal on a big prowess turn feels nuts. I mean that's true, but again, I just think there are really there's more unfair ways to use blazing shoal yeah. than sure. basically in fact. And it's like it's I'm like not even... blazing shoal worse than like the current state of like hammer time. Maybe yeah. I think the difference with Hammer Time is it has onboard patterns you get to see. Blazing Shoal just like, I mean, yeah, you know that you're playing fucking Shining Shoal right now. I don't want to hear this shit from you. <laughs> <laughs> Free my soul, brethren. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, that's a ban list. Yeah. All right. That's it. We did it. I think that's it. We made it through. Well, uh, right. I'm just going to wrap up here. Uh, thank, thanks for watching. Um, if you're here in the Discord, thanks for uh, chatting and hanging out with us. Um, and again, special thanks to uh, Phoenix for preparing all yeah, the slides. Yeah, this is awesome. We, uh, we couldn't have done this massive production value without him. Yeah, production value through the roof. Um, Never looked better. You know, if if you're on uh, YouTube, um, can, I, can I post the, 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 the like, Discord link? In like the description or what? Is that a thing? I say, I I mean, there's nothing to stop you from it. All right, sure, yeah, you can get the link down below. You can uh, chat with uh, your fellow taxers about the set. Um, you know, come hang out with us. Send us lots of love. Uh, till next time. Till next set, I guess. Uh, Camix, you wanna <laughs> you wanna you wanna, you wanna do a little sign off? You wanna do you wanna share your socials? Yeah, yeah. Um, no. I don't have socials. I don't go. exist anywhere but here in this Discord. Uh, you guys have a good one. <laughs> yeah. Karen, do you want to share any socials? I actually don't have any socials, but like I, Perfect. they don't exist at all. So uh, you can find me here. All right, so there you go. So if you want the the hottest and spiciest takes and the sickest death and taxes brews, you got to be here in the Discord. You can find them anywhere else. <laughs> and uh, that's it for our show. For thanks for watching, and we'll uh, see you guys. I guess. Maybe, maybe maybe we'll do this again for uh, Innistrad Two Electric Boogaloo in a couple of weeks. Yeah, when we have Thalia, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> when we weeks. actually get Thalia, Thalia uh, Three, the the best one. Please not four mana, unless it's like I don't know four mana do something crazy. Planeswalker. All right, Planeswalker. I gotta go. Yeah. All right. Bye bye.